grape and wine industries. This program is really a culmination of a year of discussions between our department and people in industry, many of you, um, and hopefully the beginning of a partnership to make the industry, the grape and wine industry in California and beyond more diverse, equitable and inclusive. We have a great program planned for you today. We have three parts after our introductory uh, comments and our keynote speaker, we'll be talking about diversifying uh, the university, uh, UC Davis and our department um, as training the future leaders of the industry. Then we'll be talking about diversity and equity in the industry itself, followed by our last section on diversifying the consumer base for wine and other related beverages. I hope you'll find the information you hear this morning useful at your companies, your organizations, and in your own careers. Our hope is to leave you with as many actionable items as possible during the next three hours. So first I have a few general housekeeping items and thank yous. If you have questions, uh, if you have questions, uh, please ask them through the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. We'll try to get as many to as many as possible. If your question is not answered due to time constraints, uh, the panelists and or speakers may answer during other parts of the program. So take look, look out for those answers, or we'll try to provide answers to the attendees in email after the program. Uh, for those of you interested, Caroline has put instructions for our simultaneous translation and closed captioning in the chat. I'd like to thank uh, our extension, extension and industry relation partnership uh, program partners for their support. You see them here on this slide. Without them, we're not able to offer programs like this and especially offer them uh, at, at no cost to you. I'd like to give a special shout out to our extension, uh, um, to our executive leadership board for sponsoring the translation services into Spanish. I'd like to thank our speakers for sharing their time and experience with us. Um, and I'd like to give a special thank you to Karen Block and Caroline Furman for organizing the program this morning, along with the rest of the organizing committee that worked with us, including Andy Waterhouse and Nita Oberholster. And a final thank you to Leticia Chacon Rodriguez for translation um, into of some of our slides and announcements into Spanish. So thank you to all of them. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to attend. Please remember to fill out our survey at the end of the program. That helps us with future programming. Um, and now we'll begin our program. It is my pleasure to introduce UC Davis Chancellor Gary May. Uh, for opening remarks. His vision at UC Davis, his vision as UC Davis's seventh chancellor is to lead the university to new heights in academic excellence, inclusion, public service, and upward mobility for students from all backgrounds. He previously served as Dean of Georgia Tech's College of Engineering, the largest and most diverse school of its kind in the nation. Chancellor May earned his master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley. He's won numerous awards for his research in computer-aided manufacturing of integrated circuits. In 2015, President Obama honored him with the Presidential Award for Excellence in STEM Mentoring. In 2021, he received the prestigious Lifetime Mentor Award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science for demonstrating extraordinary leadership to increase participation of underrepresented groups in the fields of science and engineering. He was inducted in, uh, to the National Academy of Engineering in September of 2018, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in April of 2020. His prom a prominent voice in higher education, Chancellor May is a commissioner of the National Council on Competitiveness. He serves as vice chair of the university's Research Association Council of Presidents, and is on the executive committee of the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities Board of Directors. Please welcome Chancellor Gary May. Well, thank you, David. And on behalf of UC Davis, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's program, the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the grape and wine industries. 
You can look forward to a morning of important conversations about one of the wine industry's most pressing challenges. According to the Association of African American Vintners, uh, fewer than 1% of winemakers currently are black and even fewer are brand owners. And of more than 4,000 wineries in California, only a few dozen are Latinx owned. It's not hard to notice uh, this underrepresentation as someone who loves wine. Uh, one of the great perks of living in Davis is being close to so many world-class wineries. And one of my favorite ways to unwind is sharing a bottle of, uh, of wine with my wife at our favorite wine bar in downtown Davis. But whether I'm on a winery tour or simply a customer at a wine bar, I just don't see many others who look like me. And I believe we have a great opportunity to change this. Wine is meant for everyone and from consumers to winemakers and those who want to establish their own brands. So I'm really proud to lead an institution that wants to help create change and diversify the pipeline of talent in this industry. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are core values here at UC Davis. Uh, we're pursuing a 10 year strategic plan called To Boldly Go. And one of our key goals is, to, uh, is related to diversity. We are really driven to embrace it, practice inclusive excellence, and strive for equity. When I joined UC Davis in 2017, I created a position Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And since then, uh, Vice Chancellor Renetta Tull and her team have done important work uh, in outreach and access. Their office is committed to inclusive working, learning, and living environments for all members of our community. Our world-renowned Department of Viticulture and Enology is also doing good work to expand opportunities for people of color. They've had success increasing the number of Chicanx Latinx students in the department and are working to expand this with other groups as well. The Broadening Horizons program is also helping to build and sustain a diverse student population. These goals are especially crucial for a major research university like UC Davis. After all, diversity isn't just important for the social good, which it is. Diversity is also key to innovation and shaping the global workforce. Without it, there can be design flaws and innovations that sometimes omit women or people of color. Here, here's an example. Uh, automated faucets and soap dispensers. In some public restrooms, if I put my hands under uh, the sink with my palms down, like so, uh, I, I don't get soap or water. Why? Uh, because the dispensers are not calibrated properly for the darker pigment in my skin. One more example. Uh, the first airbags in the auto industry uh, almost killed women passengers. Why? Because they were tested on crash test dummies with male anatomies. Uh, th these are just a couple of quick examples. I could go on with several more, um, but the point I think is clear. Diversity as a practical matter leads to better outcomes and better products. So whether we're talking about engineering or winemaking, diversity can drive innovation and build talent in the global economy. I look forward to a day when the field of winemaking is as diverse as the world around us. I look forward to getting wine recommendations from sommeliers that hail from a wide variety of backgrounds. And I look forward to meeting more winery owners who come from underrepresented backgrounds and learning about uh, more about their stories and well-crafted wines. Now, before I go, I have to leave you with one thought. Diversity is everybody's job. It requires commitment from the highest levels of an organization all the way down. And that commitment needs to be for the long haul with our leaders modeling inclusive uh, uh, behaviors along the way. So I appreciate everyone joining today and sharing their voice. Uh, there's work to be done in building diversity, equity, and inclusion in the wine industry. And today's program is important for creating much needed dialogue and strategies. I have no doubt that you will leave feeling inspired and empowered. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chancellor May, for those remarks. I really appreciate your being here with us on this important day for us. I next like to introduce Dean Helene Dillard, Helene Dillard was appointed Dean of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at UC Davis in January 2014. She's the Chief Academic Administrative Officer of the college and oversees 14 departments, 29 centers and institutes, and more than 7,400 undergraduate students, 380 faculty, and 800 staff. And of course, our department is part of, uh, part of that college. In addition to her responsibilities as Dean, she has programmatic responsibilities for the college's agricultural experiment station and cooperative extension. Dean Dillard has national and international leadership experience, including invited consultations, presentations, and scientific exchanges in China, Central America, South America, the European Union, and Zimbabwe. 
Prior to her appointment at UC Davis, Dean Dillard was on the faculty at Cornell University for 30 years as a professor of plant pathology, carrying a 50% research and 50% extension appointment. So she's certainly very familiar with extension and it's impor very important to her as it is to us. Her research focused on biology, ecology, and management of fungal pathogens that cause diseases and vegetable crops. Her interests include sustainable disease management strategies, integrated pest management, epidemiology, and host pathogen environment interactions. Immediately prior to joining UC Davis, she was the director of Cornell Cooperative Extension and simultaneously served as an associate dean in two colleges, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the College of Human Ecology. Dean Dill Dillard has been recognized for her contributions in plant pathology by the American Phytopathological Society, receiving the Excellence in Extension Award and being named as APS Fellow in 2006. She received the New York Farmers Medal and Outstanding Faculty Award from uh, CALS in 2013. She was born and raised in San Francisco, California. She completed her bachelor's degree in biology and natural resources at UC Berkeley, and then went on to graduate work here at UC Davis, receiving her master's in soil science uh, and her PhD in plant pathology. Please welcome Dean Dillard for her opening remarks and for her to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Dave. Dean Dillard. Thank you, Dave. Um, and good morning, everyone. Um, Chancellor May mentioned the strategic goal for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, we're taking that charge to heart. So we're looking at how we teach, the spaces we create and share, and the measures that we take to provide a true representation of our community within our academic and social environments. There are so many reasons why it makes sense for agriculture and the wine industry to consider diversity, equity, and inclusion at every level of the business. And I'm really happy that the Department of Viticulture and Enology has opened this discussion. The history of agriculture has not always set a table that was welcoming to diverse groups. So as we have an honest discussion today about how we can move forward, some distrust still lingers among various communities and it will take thoughtful and strategic actions by everyone to overcome this. So whether it's inspiring a diverse group of students to study ag, providing career education and growth opportunities for farm workers in the fields, or partnering with various groups, um, we all have the ability to play an important role at some point along the pipeline to advance our capacity to create spaces where diverse thoughts, backgrounds, and experiences are not only respected, but celebrated. And so it's really my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Julia Coney. Julia Coney is a Washington DC and Houston, Texas based wine writer, wine educator, speaker and consultant. Her wine writing includes stories on wine, winemakers and the intersection of race, wine and language. She holds a WSET level two certification in wine and spirits and is currently pursuing her master level champagne certification with the Wine Scholar Guild and the WSET level three certification. Julia is the recipient of the Wine Enthusiast 2020 Social Visionary Award winner for her work in writing and speaking on diversity, equity and inclusion in the wine industry. Julia is the founder of Black Wine Professionals, a resource for wine industry employers and gatekeepers, professionals, and the food and beverage community. Their goal is to uplift the multifaceted Black professionals in the world of wine. Julia is a contributing editor for Vine Pair, the world's largest online drinks platform. And her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Wine Enthusiast, Thrillist, the Tasting Pattern Panel, the Washington Post, and several other uh, venues. So with that, please join me in welcoming Julia with us today, and we're so happy that you could join us. Oh, thank you all. Thank you, UC Davis. I mean, I am I'm just blown away and honored because I, I think over the past year, we've had so much, so many things that are, have been so positive to happen under such dire circumstances of why we all are here. And I just want to start, as I always start all of my conversations, I want everyone listening to give yourself grace and also give yourself grace as the world opens back up, because now we are in this new normal. It's, you know, we're still technically in a pandemic, but 
the wine world is booming in a way. And the reason why I say that is because we have more new voices in wine that are being highlighted. We have more people wanting to join the industry. And so I think a lot of times when we talk about DEI and Carolyn has put the definitions in the chat for people to really understand and read what they are. Because sometimes DEI doesn't get a definition. We just know it means diversity. We know it means equity and we know it means inclusion. But these are definitions for you to read. And actually Carolyn can send it out after you know everything's over. So you have why we should talk about it. And one of the things for wine that I always want to implore is think about the consumer and think about the industry and think about dollars. We have these new consumers who do not look like the normal wine consumer of previous generations. And that's okay. And that's a good thing because we want this industry to thrive. So in our small, we're talking small steps. I want everybody and I implore you, and I did this this weekend to myself to make sure I was like on par as well. One thing you can do is diversify your social media feeds. When I say diversify your feeds, not necessarily just your marketing, because I know we have a lot of wineries on here and a lot of people who work in the business, but your personal page. When you're scrolling through Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, what does it look like? Are you seeing people of different races, different ethnicities, different sizes? I mean, I was listening to the chancellor and he was saying that about the, the water and the soap and I had no idea that it took place. So it's very fascinating for me that I didn't even know that and I'm learning something as I'm also in this journey. So when you're looking at your social feed, what does it represent? Does it represent someone who, and everyone looks like yourself? Or does it have people like you can learn from who may be someone you didn't know about? It could be someone younger. It also could be someone older. Because I think a lot of times when we talk about consumers, we're automatically going to younger people. And I started late in wine. So I'm always thinking about we still have older people who are also becoming new to wine because they're learning about it through social media through Instagram, and we all know that platform is huge, even TikTok, and all these means of communicating wine. How do we get those people and all those people on this platform to actually keep buying more wine? Not just in the realm of they know a celebrity has wine, but also they want to be a part of the industry. And if you, if you look at your social feed and you can say, my feed looks different, I want it to look different. And that is a great thing as well. The second thing I implore you is to diversify your reading. I know last year, a lot of people read a lot of books on racism and how to be better allies and how to fight for pe BIPOC people and how to just show up and speak, speak up and be bold about that. As John Lewis would say, get in good trouble. But when it comes to your reading, I want you to also read books on joy by BIPOC people. And when I say that, if you're, if you're a lover of romance or thrillers or history books, how many authors of color are you reading from those genres? You don't have to like think about it you know, all the time, but just know maybe at your local bookstore, an independent bookstore, ask them, how can I find diverse, read, diverse authors? Because when you read books, that help you outside of black trauma and about racism, you also get to see what we see as people of color, we see joy. And I am always trying to go, yes, there's a lot we need to do. Yes, we have to do the DEI work. Yes, we have to talk about it. Yes, we have to be uncomfortable, but also I want you to experience our joy in ways that, you know, hey, I didn't know there was many black authors writing sci-fi or writing murder thrillers. Like I'm a big fan of like Walter Mosey, which is kind of like a thriller and a spy book and same thing and Tenerife Do, which is science fiction. All these authors exist in our world, but usually when we're talking about DEI work, the books are usually always based on racism. What can people do? And those are good. We need everyone to keep reading those books. But last year was a summer of reading. We read a lot. There was all the talks and they were in here now, but then how do we keep this momentum going? How do we look at the future as the world opens? And that's one of the things I would say, diversify your reading. 
And if you are a TV person or if you are not a television person, I am asking everyone who is watching and will rewatch this call to go on Netflix, watch Uncork the movie. It is a fiction movie based about wine. If you didn't see it, I want you to watch it. But I also want you to watch the docu-series called High on the Hog. And watch it the first time, because I've watched it a couple of times and I still get emotional about it, to understand the place of African-American food in the history of America. And there's portions in that that's talking about agriculture. And that's what we're here for. We're, we want more winemakers of color. And when you see how people of color, how black people, African-Americans contribute to the cuisine of this country, but we're not talking about the, the agriculture component of that, it's a lesson for all of us to understand. And so as you look at these definitions, go in and watch the show and go, okay, I did not know this, but you'll see a young woman on the show and she is farming. And one of the things, there are so many historical black colleges and universities that have agriculture programs. And my work is, is wanting to build and bridge those agricultural students to wine. But how do we do that, right? We have to be able to say, someone looks like you is actually talking about wine from an agricultural perspective. But also in that, we know people want to feel welcome. And that goes back to the inclusion part. So in the inclusion part that we're speaking of, harvest is coming upon us. You're going to have probably now more people of color participating in your harvest. I want, if you have, or were at a winery, to really think how that person may feel, having empathy for them that they are the minority. How do they feel welcome? How do even when you're joking that the jokes are not insensitive to that person? Because a lot of times when we, when we think, I, you know, I've, I've heard stories, I've done harvest, and some, one of my experiences was great and one of them was not so great. You know, when we think that sometimes the jokes are off color, they really are off color and they're offensive. So as we now move and you have people participating in your harvest around the world, around in, you know, in California, how can you be a true ally to make that person feel comfortable at the harvest and while they're working and also feeling like a team player? That is one of the beautiful things people want to feel welcome. It goes back to, I always say it's the idea of, and I'm dating myself if people know this, the idea of cheers, right? Remember when Norm walked in and it was like, hey, you know, where everybody knows your name. Everyone wants to feel that. And that has nothing to do with color. That has to be in a human being. We want to feel welcome. And if we don't feel welcome, then we retreat. And it becomes a way of being self-protective of our peace. And so when people go to harvest in, their, in your tasting rooms, and that's one of the things I will talk about a little later in the tasting rooms, what is your tasting room culture? So as the world opens up and everyone's traveling now, and you see people of color coming to your tasting rooms, how are the staff that are hosting them presenting themselves to the client, to the customer, if you want to call them, because we're already going to be on edge because we're the only people of color maybe in your tasting room that day. And we want to know we feel, we don't feel slighted. We don't need to make an exception. We just want to be treated equally. And that is one of the questions and one of the feelings that a lot of people don't always have when you're a person of color walking into a space where you, you're thinking, how am I going to be treated today? And so with that, I am asking you to do a training with your tasting room staff. If you got to do it one-on-one, -on -one, and we're talking about, again, these small steps. People are traveling to tasting rooms. Some people are having not so great experiences, and you might not know that, but, and some people are. And the reason why I go from my perspective of having bad experiences in tasting rooms, and it's just educating your staff, don't treat anybody, you know, how you wouldn't want to be treated. Because at the end of the day, we all have bias. Everyone has a bias. 
How do we not make the bias a prejudice? And so with the small steps, if your staff and you as the manager and leader or the owner are getting a new perspective, a new perspective on different cultures, then you take that down and it's a trickle down effect, right? A lot starts with the top of, of the organization. How's the top explaining everything else to everyone under the umbrella? That is why it's the small steps and it goes back to reading. What are you reading? What are you watching? What are you listening? And also, are you actually, when you're looking at your social, it goes back, are you reading the captions or are you just scrolling? Because a lot of times people are really getting valuable information in these, in these spaces, but you also have to listen. And with listening, and it's even hard for me because I do a lot of DEI work, it's still very uncomfortable. Having these conversations sometimes means a level of understanding you're not used to, and also a level, level of empathy you may not thought you needed. With the difficult conversations, I always believe, give yourself, it goes back to grace that I say at the beginning of the speech, give yourself grace, but know the DEI work takes all of us being uncomfortable. Not just you, me, we all have to be uncomfortable to make these necessary changes. And when we're making these changes, think about a future of wine. Think about the wine industry that you wanna see in 10 years, 15 years, 20, 20 years, because also it is a marathon and not a sprint. I know we've been busy over the past you know, year and we're all on the Zooms, we're on here now. And it's like, oh my God, I just wanna make so much change. I wanna do it so fast. Like, what am I doing wrong? You're not doing anything wrong. It's not about being wrong or right. It's about being better. And if we could come and say, how do I be better? How do I present that to my staff? How do I present that to my team? How do I be better? I just want to be better. And that means looking at things from a different lens and also saying, I got to give myself patience. I got to give myself time. I have to give myself empathy and know that the DEI work, there is no end date. I know a lot of times we want to say there's an end date for this and there's an end date for that. DEI, I always say my DEI work and your DEI work because we're working together. You're, you're here because you want to be better. You're listening to me and you're gonna to listen to everyone on these panels because we want to see this industry thrive, 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 thrive. We're here to do the work. The work does not end. The work ends for you when you're no longer here. And I know that can sound a little bit morbid, but the work will always be the work. And we have to maintain and put forth all the work all the time because at the end of the day is good for business. Wine is a business. We want people to buy wine. We want people to work in the wine industry. We, we want that stat from the African-American Vintners Association. We want to raise that. We want more BIPOC winemakers, more BIPOC wine brands. We want all of that. We want to see, we don't want to see, oh, we're, we're losing to this beverage or we're losing people to that beverage or what happens when the boomers are not buying wine? Let's create some new boomers. That's what we want to do. And so as we do the DEI work and people feel more welcome, they feel more like I am included in this industry. I am a consumer and I go to a tasting. I am included. I feel great. So what does that person do? They go home, they tell their family, they tell their friends, hey, I'm coming to visit the Napa Valley. Hey, I'm coming to visit Paso. Hey, I want to go tour Davis. I'm thinking about joining the industry. Maybe I need to go get some credits. Okay, how do we get people in college to transfer and go to Davis? All those is all connected. So it's not one or the other. It's not oh, if I work at the winery, it has nothing to do with this portion, or if I work at the university, it doesn't have anything to do with the tasting room. We're all connected. We literally are a wine family. And in order for our wine family to survive, we all have to come together and say, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, is my job, it's your job, it's our job. And when we look at it as, collectively our job doesn't mean it's going to be easy it's like a family right you know sometimes like if you have siblings or cousins and everything some days you get along some days you don't some days everybody's like happy and some days you want to just 
punch a person in the arm because you're like, oh, they're getting on my nerves, but we're still a family. And if we come to our industry as a familiar family unit, we can see the next generations and the generations to come and we can actually encourage and increase more wine consumers, more wine industry, more wine makers who look like the world that we all live in. And that world is full of color, fascination, culture, happiness, energy, and that's the world we want to live in. So thank you all for having me. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I have, I'm looking at the chat for Jim Q&A. What would be a good starting curriculum for uh, training tasting room staff? I would say as your tasting room staff have a meeting and go, hey, when we see people of color and what are our perceptions? You have to ask these questions to your staff. And if you can't ask that question, then you need to ask yourself, why can't I ask that question? We need to know the bias of that. What may have read, heard, thought. And with that, you go, okay, here's the thing. Every person that walks in here is a dollar sign, is green. So that color is what we're concerned with. Green and enjoyment. How can we make the green and enjoyment happen and work together? But you have to talk to your staff. You have to tell your staff because also tasting rooms are sales, right? We're selling it. That's what we want. We want everybody, we want you to have a taste and then we want you to buy some bottles. So how do we get them, everyone to look that way? How do we get everyone to assume and know that people, there are people walk in that are novices, people walk in as experienced wine drinkers. We treat them all the same. I walked into a tasting room one time and someone swirled my glass for me before they ever handed me the glass. That's not acceptable. That's not, you don't need to explain why there's, you know, why, you know, to a person that just walks in when they're sitting down, it's like, oh, this is, you know, air radar wine, get some air into it. This is where you can enjoy it more. You can experience it more. We want you to experience it. This is why we have these, the food. And also I'm going to bring this up in your tasting room foods. Diversify your food. I know a lot of tasting rooms venture on Eurocentric cuisine. Throw some soul food in there. Throw some Asian cuisine and throw, throw some like Takaki chips or something. Throw some barbecue lays. Throw some chicharrones. Throw something different besides your crackers. And you'll be shocked to find out how many people just enjoy that. It's really, really fun. Um, thank you so much um, for that question. Uh, Allison, I've heard others say that it should be called IED rather than DEI because they felt like inclusion was more important than diversity. What is your perspective on the order of importance when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? I don't have a preference, Allison. If someone wants to call it IED, I just think that term people don't associate with DEI necessarily, but I do understand why someone would say inclusion. But we also have to admit, like, inclusion is also sometimes once you get there, but diversity is, and equity is how do we get that person there? So that's something to also think about, but I have no preference of which order. I just think it's kind of more of an alliteration for the words DEI. It's, it's alphabetical, and that's how I look at that. Uh, Anonymous says, what is the role of the wine industry associations in this work? A lot of the wine industry associations are working together. I will say over the past year, I've been on a lot of calls. I've been in communications. They are working to do this, but like I said, it's a slow process, and as we move forward, that's what we need to do. We realize it's a process and we might wanna change it tomorrow, but I will say this industry from June 2nd of 2020 until June 7th of what we're talking about now, vast improvements. It is just amazing. It is amazing what the industry has done and the people in this industry that are actually doing a lot of the work. So um, uh, how can the wine industry be more welcoming persons with less economic resources? I will say the way they do that is don't be elitist when it comes to wine. You know, wine already sounds elitist, right? We say words like terroir. I could say if you were, if you're talking to a person who really doesn't understand what terroir means, why can't we just say the dirt or the soil? It's the, why can't we just say that, right? 
why it, you know, we already think about it. We have a glass and we swirl and we have all these things. And I usually tell people, I said, I kind of, you know what this is, I'm swirling it. Why? It needs air. You know, everything needs air. You need air. The plants need air. And we, when you break it down, it's just a way of presenting wine. That's fun. Because some people just don't even want to learn. They just want to come and enjoy wine with their friends. And that's okay too. And we just have to say, that's okay. And that's some way of looking about that. So for like economic resources, we have to make it presentable. We have to make it fun. That's why you have a lot of like interesting wine and hip hop, wine and movies, wine and TV. But if you can relate to just being a kind person to a person, no matter their economic circumstances, that person once again, wants to feel welcome. So um, Adrian says, can you tell us about a positive experience at a winery that you would like to see replicated at other wineries? I'm going to say I had a very positive, I'm not going to name the winery, but I went in with some friends and we were the only people of color. And I was there with like, I had white friends, Hispanic friends, me and a couple of people. And what it was, was the person didn't try to sell us. They just brought the wine. We did our tasting. And afterwards, we were able to ask questions because it's kind of like they read the room. And I think sometimes wineries forget to just read the room is reading your audience. You could have a group that wants to party. You can have a group like, you know, us who was just sitting there and we just kind of want to look out and just see the pretty vines. And they read the room. And it was really, really nice because we had such a great experience. We were just all just so relaxed. And so I appreciated the tasting room associate because he understood that he stepped back and just let us have our space. He gave us, you know, what, you know, they need to say, the spiel, which we were perfectly fine with, but they left us alone. And not because they were like, we're, we're like leaving you alone. They could read the room and see, we were just tired. So a lot of that was really, really fun. And I, I really had a great uh, experience with that. I will say, just learn to read the room and you'll be okay. David would like to connect with you. I have a scholarship fund, the Black Winemakers. This past winter, we gave two $5,000 scholarships. And we would give two more in the fall and annually there. After we had a good number of applicants non from UC Davis, would love to have more students from your school apply early. That's great. That is great. So thank you. Yeah, that is, Dave is going to answer that one live. So I am Julia Coney, Black Wine Professionals Wine Journeys. I want to thank you for listening. And I also want to thank you for telling yourself every single day, DEI is your life's work. But in your life's work, you give yourself grace. And that's what we all need. Thank you, Julia. That was awesome. I was taking notes. Um, <laughs> and I, I put down a quote from you. It's not about being wrong or right. It's about being better. I like that. Thank you so much. Yeah. No end to the DEI work. Oh, yeah. um, we appreciate your, your uh, discussion this morning. And I know you're going to join us for another panel. Yes. Um, so at this time, we're going to have a panel. Um, and I will be the moderator for the panel. Um, our panelists will be David Block, uh, the professor and Marvin Sands Department Chair of the Department of Viticulture and Enology at UC Davis. We'll have Akimi DeVos, co-founder of the Roots Fund. We'll have Elizabeth Forstell. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Viticulture and Enology at UC Davis. And Andrew Waterhouse, who's a professor at, in the Department of Viticulture and Enology at UC Davis. And the first question I'm going to send out to Andy. Um, and so Andy, what has the department been doing historically to increase diversity uh, within the viticulture and enology department? Uh, good morning, Dane Dillard. Um, yes, the department's been working on this for a while, actually. I have to give Dave credit. When uh, Dr. Block became chair of the department, this was about 10 years ago, um, he uh, created the Broadening Horizons program. And uh, I think I and others in the department um, had seen when we traveled, toured around the wine industry, it was pretty obvious that there was a problem because you could see that all the workers in the vineyard and the cellar um, were basically speaking Spanish. And they all came from south of the border. Uh, and the managers um, were not. And so we, we started with an effort to increase the uh, participation of Hispanic and Latinx students in the department. Um, 
So we initiated some wine tastings to raise money. We, uh, instead of bake sales, we do wine tastings here. And uh, <clears throat> after we ran several wine tastings, we had raised enough money to hire uh, a staff person to help with the diversity effort. And that was very important to have someone who's de dedicated to this, uh, to this program. And uh, I worked with them early on and uh, it took us a while to develop the right materials. Um, luckily on campus, we have lots of folks who are familiar with this landscape. And uh, we learned that our initial <laughs> outreach materials were not suitable. Uh, they all focused on academic excellence. And really, when we talk about diversifying the student body, um, we really need to address for these prospective students, the student experience. Um, I think everyone knows that if they come to Davis, that it's gonna be an excellent academic experience. What they need to, what they're concerned about is, are they gonna be welcomed? Uh, are there gonna be support groups? Are there gonna be networks of support? And so we had to, tailor the materials to focus on the fact that we do have that here. We have a very strong student club, Devo, and they are, everyone is welcome there. Um, and there are, uh, obviously you're well aware that there are other support groups on campus for students from different backgrounds. And so we needed to you know, make sure that our prospective students were aware of these, of, of these opportunities. And then, to reach our target, we reached out to schools uh, in the North Coast, uh, Napa Valley, uh, Calistoga and St. Helena, both have uh, strong programs and a large number of Hispanic students. We invited those students to come to campus and we visited those campuses. And as a result of these efforts, and I think we did more than what I've described, is the, the proportion of Hispanic students in our program went up quite a bit. It was about 10% when we started and, and it got up to about 25%. Uh, and I think it's, it's remaining about that level. Um, and you know, I think a large part of it is the, one of the reasons these students are coming is that we've been doing this for a while now. And I think it's, it's, it's clear to folks in the Hispanic community that we do actually care, right? I mean, we do want them here and we have a support system for them and there are other Hispanic students here. So um, the program has been fairly successful. Thank you, Andy. Um, the next question goes to Beth Forestell. Um, Beth, what are the department's current efforts to recruit a more diverse student population? Thanks, Helene. Um, and also too, I wanna quickly say thank you to Julia for sending such a positive message. Um, and I really agree too that that quote about is about being better because we all make mistakes and we all have our biases. And so it's really about being better and making an effort as a whole. Uh, so as far as the department is concerned, I was lucky to come in. I'm a relatively new professor and I was lucky to come into a really supportive environment where there is ongoing activity. So Andy mentioned um, broadening horizons. And so there's efforts now to expand that um, so that we can actually recruit and retain even greater diversity of students. And we also, I'm really happy to see that Christopher Renfro is here. So that's uh, the 280 project is something that he started. Um, and with the collaboration of Steve Mathiason an alumni from, from our ag school. And it's a really, really amazing um, internship and urban farming opportunity for those who are in underrepresented groups in the San Francisco area. Um, he has been running vineyards in Alamany, at Alamany Farm and now I think in Bayview that he started a new one. And so there are interns, I'm actually going to briefly change my background because it's easier in sharing screen, but you can see these are, there's, there's Chris up right there, his back's just, but just that there's, this is an amazing effort to actually integrate more diversity and generate a more inclusive environment in the vineyard. And so Steve Mathiason has been setting up um, these visits every Friday. And also they go back and help, and he goes back and brings experts to Almany Farm. And Chris is pretty much an expert himself as well. And 
they'll be coming as part of some of our summer, summer programs that we're raising money for, for um, retention and recruitment. Um, they'll be coming in the summer to visit UC Davis and see opportunities here and see research and interact with faculty in the winery. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a really amazing thing to work on. Additionally, we have the plant agricultural biology grad admissions pathway, which is with plant sciences. And now um, our department is involved and we are, um, we've renewed the application for it. And it's a program with several HBCUs, um, which hopefully will expand. I know Julie had mentioned in the past that there are a lot of them in the country that have agricultural programs or chemistry or other programs. And so a bunch of our faculty, both in viticulture and enology are involved in that. And we have a student this summer, um, Abigail Simon, who is working with me and a few others on pest and physiology interactions. And unfortunately she can't be here in person, but uh, that'll be the first one coming to viticulture and enology. Daria Cantu has had some in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and then as well, one thing that I think is really important to mention is that the student organization Devo and students involvement has really increased as well. This is the first time they decided to elect a DEI officer and become a lot more engaged in the efforts. Um, they're a really, really welcoming and great group of students. And so I think they'll play a really critical role in mentoring um, and making it more of an inclusive environment. And then we've done a lot of work and this is actually the leadership of Helene being on the DEI committee for the college um, with other faculty in plant sciences is create resources for equity and inclusion in the classroom. And this relates a lot to, to Julia's comments about having greater representation of, of who you show when you're talking about scientists, when you're talking about viticulturalists or others that are important in agriculture, um, talking about people that are really important like George Washington Carver and others who are rarely mentioned, but but probably should be, or definitely should be. Um, and then a, there was a student-led class, I'll just close with this briefly, by Lauren Saltiel, a grad student, um, a master's student in the program, where we brought in a really diverse group of, of people from industry and academia to lead discussions on wine and society and labor and issues around wine industry. It included um, Dr. Monique Bell, Colin Guy, um, Miguel de Leon, Amelia Seha, and many others. Um, and I think that a, was a really nice starting point for getting students to think about some of these issues and bring some of them back into industry and the workforce, so. Great, thank you, Beth. Um, the next uh, panelist is Akimi DeBose. And Akimi, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, what is the Roots Fund and what are the goals for this fund? And what is your progress to date? How does it involve viticulture and enology at UC Davis? Good morning to everyone. Thank you for having me today. It's so important that we continue to have these types of conversations. Uh, so I am the executive director of the Roots Fund. And the Roots Fund is an organization dedicated to helping the BIPOC and communities of color in the wine industry through education of scholarships, providing mentorship and job placement. So a big part of the work that we do is we're going out to encourage relationships all throughout the wine business to create inclusivity through creating new spaces for people of color. And we focus all of our work around creating opportunities and eliminating obstacles. So what that means for us, just as an example, if someone is studying at um, UC Davis perhaps, or studying for one of their certifications and we're creating tuition payments for them to be able to study. We're also providing resources for them to be able to receive mentorship. We assist with making sure they have all the tools they need to study, whether that be the purchasing of wine or whether that be the purchasing of books. We've created tutoring within our programs for anyone that is studying in school. And what's super important about it is all of our resources are free to people of color. There is nothing that they have to financially participate. So that takes a big burden off of them being able to pursue their education and pursue any type of career they wanna have in wine. Um, we're a big believer here at the Roots Fund of no ceilings. Um, there is nothing that you can't do. If you come to us and say, hey, I wanna be a magician who is a psalm who also wants to be a winemaker, we want to kind of focus on how can we get you to all of those pathways. And we utilize all of our resources. We build networking opportunities on a monthly basis, which is super great. 
where all of our scholars can get together with working professionals and kind of talk about different things that are happening in the industry. Um, and a big part of the work that we do is we create accountability. Uh, we are not a scholarship program where you can come and get a scholarship and walk away. I tell everyone you are joining a lifelong cult when you join the Roots Fund. Um, we are, are doing the work here. And what that means is uh, folks who get scholarships and they're open to all ages of people of color, any aspect of the industry. When they come to us, it's mandatory that you participate in mentorship. Um, we want to know what's going on in your career. We also hold spaces for people to talk about what's going on in their personal lives. A lot of people have been heavily affected in the pandemic for work. Uh, we provide resources for things like that. And at the same time, we hold accountability for anyone that interacts with us, including UC Davis. I know David could probably attest to that. And what that means is um, we ask employers who wanna advertise jobs with us, what are they doing for DEI space? What does their staffing currently look like? You know, what are your plans for new hires? What does that process look like? When they interview someone, you can't just interview a person of color and say, hey, I interviewed them and they never get hired. If you advertise three jobs with us and you never fill them with us, that makes me question, what are you really trying to do? Are you trying to check a box? Or are you really trying to hire someone of color? Um, anyone who's engaged with me in the industry knows that I'm definitely relentless in our goals here. Um, we create short-term goals for a long-term vision here at the Roots Fund. We're big on doing. Um, I'm an avid believer if there's a meeting, then something actionable needs to come out of it because I have, I have a responsibility to the scholars you know, in this industry. I have a responsibility to hold the vendors accountable as well. So that's really the work that we're doing. It's creating change. We're at a 99% effective rate within our program. We've created 67 scholars to date. Scholarships just ended you know, a week ago. So we're super excited about that. And we're, we offer those opportunities four times a year, along with a variety of enrichment trips that we do around the country and internationally in 2022, where we will take groups of people of color out into different wine businesses to spend periods of time, whether they're learning about regions, learning about different types of wine or varietals. So this has been already um, super effective. We're in Lodi actually today uh, on a series of enrichment trips that we have here. So we're super excited about that. And um, our high school program launched last year, which we're excited to partner with UC Davis in the fall. We'll be bringing high school kids, <clears throat> excuse me, from the San Francisco area. And they'll come out and visit UC Davis for a half day. They'll go to a winery for a half day. And then we end the tours with a tasting for the parents. So I think that we need to keep in mind, we're introducing these high school students into the wine industry, but a lot of the parents have never had any type of knowledge about wine. You know, the average liquor store in a large big city community um, sells Yellowtail and nothing wrong with Yellowtail, <clears throat> but there's more wines in the world than Yellowtail. So being able to have those type of conversations with parents are super important as well. And um, what I really implore and really love about our relationship with UC Davis is when David and I first spoke and Elizabeth, we talked about how do we, it's not only looking at their recruitment and increasing it for diverse people, but what type of work is the campus doing? You know, what type of mental health resources are they providing? Are we doing some sort of integration of housing? You know, because if you take someone of color from their city community, you bring them out to a rural school with a lot of people that doesn't look like them, how are we supporting and encouraging their environment? And I truly applaud UC Davis for the work that they are doing. Um, we are constantly in communication and conversations to improve our relationships there. And proud to say we have about nine scholars already that have completed this past year with between undergrad, your master's program and your continuing education in winemaking. So we're super excited about our relationship and continuing to move that forward. Great, thank you, uh, Akimi. And in the, in the Q and A, there is a question about, please visit us in Redwood Valley, Mendocino. And then there's another uh, uh, question that came from Stephanie Love. Um, it's really not a question, but it's a, it's a, a shout out. Uh, she said the Roots Fund is very unique in that they offer wonderful mentorship in addition to financial assistance. And as a proud scholar, she found being able to share my, her wildest dreams with Akimi and the whole Roots Fund supporting me uh, has truly been invaluable, makes her want to pay it forward as she succeeds um, and she'll take others with her. So sounds like you're doing a great job. Thank you, Akimi. Thank you so uh, much. Our next uh, panelist is David Block, the chair of the department. Um, Dave, what do you see as the major challenges to success in increasing diversity? Well, it's, it's really great to, 
to hear all the people talking about what's what's going on and what the possibilities are. And of course, you know, it's it's important that we diversify um, our student population as much as possible um, because you know we feel like the students that we train today are going to be leaders in the industry tomorrow. And so it's it's really important for us to start now. Um, there there were some comments in in the chat about scholarships and I, and I apologize to uh, Marcia, I pushed the wrong button and was hoping to just email you or chat you the uh, what, what you could do um, to work with us on scholarships, but I'll answer, answer it live now. Um, maybe Caroline can put my contact information um, uh, and into the chat. Um, I'm happy to talk to people about scholarships. Scholarships are super important. We have a lot of students who would not be able to be here um, at the university without that kind of financial support. So it's absolutely critical. But I do want to make, and, and so we, we would love to be working with you, Marcia, and the Black Winemaker Scholarship Fund to make sure that our students can apply for those scholarships as well and get those scholarships. I do want to, uh, and, and you know, I think, it, Akimi touched on this as well as some of the other panelists. It's, it's impossible to give a scholarship to a person who doesn't know that they want to be a winemaker or grape grower. And so that means that in addition to the scholarships, we have to make sure that we don't ignore recruitment. Recruitment is going to be absolutely critical. There are a lot of students out there who don't know that winemaking or grape growing is going to be an option for them. I grew up in an environment where alcoholic beverages were not part of you know, the culture that I was in. And I had no clue that this would be uh, a, a rewarding career for me, that there were rewarding careers in this area. And I think that's true of a lot of underrepresented minorities as, as well. Um, if it's not in your culture, you don't even think of this. You might think of being a doctor, you might think of going into pharmaceuticals, or you might think of going into other aspects of food and never think of winemaking or grape growing as an option. So I think recruitment efforts are gonna be really important. It's not straightforward. We'd love to have people working with us on this and providing resources or their time. Um, recruiting from high school for freshmen at UC Davis has all the challenges of, you know, students applying here as freshmen um, are applying as 17 year olds four years before they can legally drink alcohol. And so that's a challenge for us. Um, we, for those reasons, um, while we think that continuing some of the things we've done with Broadening Horizons, but in, in a broader community is going to be important. We think also focusing on community colleges and letting community college students know early on in their career that, um, that these are options for them. If they love science and they love food or whatever it is, that these are options. We think that's going to be important. Either going to those community colleges or bringing students and their counselors and teachers to campus to explain to them about that. Um, and we also think going to HBCUs and, and Hispanic serving institutions to draw in students into our master's program are gonna be important as well. So these are all things, there are lots of other things that we can do, but we, we certainly need partnership from all of you to do that. Once the students are here, making sure they're successful is really important. And, and that takes various forms. We wanna make sure they have not only the resources that are already available generally on campus, but resources specific to our major, um, peer mentoring, peer tutoring, career counseling from our faculty and staff and, and co-students. Those are all things that are important. We've discussed these things also with, um, with the Roots Fund and others who are focused on these things as well. All of that's really important. Making sure students get um, feel welcome in our program and feel as part of, part of the family. We, used, we like to think of our, our department as kind of a family. So, there, there were comments in, in the Q&A about, you know, what, what is our diversity and how might we, um, you know, what kind of coursework and things we can include. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, as Andy mentioned, we've been up to about 25% uh, Latina, Latina students, which is great. It's way above where we are, were 10 years ago. 
we could still do better there. Um, we would like to have even greater diversity. I think overall, um, as of maybe a year or two ago, we were at 33% underrepresented minorities in our program, um, which is great. But again, we can we can do better. We can make the our population look more like um, the general population of California and beyond. Um, we we also have students uh, uh, coming from from Asia. And they add a lot of diversity to our programs as well. And so we've been thinking a lot about how do we get students um, feeling like this is one cohesive group as early as possible. And so um, I've been working with uh, Beth and uh, Mason Earls. They're going to be offering a course next year, starting very early on uh, second quarter freshman year for our freshman students and for first year transfer students to get them all together very early on in their time at Davis to make sure they're talking to each other. And they've, uh, Beth and Mason have, are planning out a really wonderful course that I think will go a long way towards getting the cohesiveness uh, in, into our program as early as possible. So um, I, I think at least these are some of the things I think are really critical, the recruitment and how do we retain those students, make them successful in their careers? I think those are some of the biggest things that we have to deal with right now. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, for any of the panelists, um, Marilyn Nagel had a question about um, the diversity of students in the program and Dave answered that. Does anyone know where we can find the diversity, uh, race, ethnicity, gender of people working in the wine industry by county? in California. Do you guys know if there is a, a database like that anywhere? Not that I know of. It doesn't okay. mean it doesn't exist, but not that I know of. All right. So it looks like Marilyn, you asked the, the, the question of the day. Um, she's also offered up that her company does bias training or inclusion training. Um, and so that's in the, the Q and A. Um, so the question from Alexandra is, do any of the panelists have a recommendation for bias training for wine employees, managers, and leaders? I know we have a lot on campus, but it's very campus specific. Um, and I know that uh, Stephen Covey has some bias training. Um, does anybody know of others? Okay. It's like, Kimmy, I actually have some great uh, bias training resources I can be sure to share with David that he can share with the community. Okay, that would be great. That'd be great. Thank you, Akimi. Um, and then um, the next one is, I understand HBCUs are an important source, but please don't forget about other schools. I am BIPOC and went to one of the Ivies. I tried getting into the industry in New York City and the dollars weren't enough. I'm still trying while working in government full time because um, I have to pay that Ivy League loan off. Um, any thoughts on that from uh, any of the panelists? I, I, I can actually talk a little bit about that. And I'm sure that Beth and maybe Akimi have things to add. I mean, we, the, the program that Beth talked about with that we're doing with plant sciences is, is hugely important because the goal of that program is to bring um, un, underrepresented minorities, especially um, black students into our PhD program so that they can be faculty members of the future. These will be future mentors and um, role models for, for students. And I think that's hugely important. And doing that, we, we've actually connected with for instance, specific HPCUs like Ford A&M that already have viticulture and allergy programs. And that would be a great place for people to um, think, oh, you know, I could get a master's in this from UC Davis and further my career. Uh, but you're right, I think we should be looking more widely. And of course, the, one, of the, one of the, I don't know if we call it a problem, one of the complications is there's so many places we can be looking and we wanna start somewhere, right? And as Julia said, you know, it's it's not a marathon. I mean, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, right? And it's, and and so it's one of the places that we're looking now. In addition to 
community colleges that we worked with and high schools that we worked with for a long time, um, new places that we're going to be partnering with, with Ikemi and the Roots Fund and so forth. But uh, yeah, we, we have to start somewhere, but you're right. We have lots of places that we could be looking. Right. And I'll just say um, as Dean of the college, what I see for the college as a whole is that our greatest diversity comes from the transfer students coming out of community colleges and other schools. And um, we're mandated to take at least a 30% of our incoming class as transfer students. Um, and I, I would say that that is where we see the greatest increase in our numbers um, for um, students of color. Um, Christopher writes, are there opportunities for students to work all the way to becoming a professor themselves? And I would assure you that Andy, David, and Beth would say, yes, yes, um, uh, because that is something they would love to do. Um, and there's lots of opportunity to do that. So I don't know, Dave, do you have a couple of words you want to say? Maybe Not a lot, you, just in the interest of time. Yeah, maybe Beth, if you if you want to talk a little bit about what what that a little bit more detail what the program is um, that that we're working on um, for that specific purpose and what we've done in the last few years that might be good for the Pow Gap program yeah specifically yeah so that's that's led by um, I should mention Diane Beckles and John Harada and and Carol Holm um, mm -hmm. and it's a pretty amazing program in that students have the opportunity it's with the UC Office of the President and students have the opportunity to come from um, undergraduate and then also master's programs they can come from as well, where they can come and spend a summer doing research and work on any project and they apply from right now three HBCUs. And I should say two, and this goes back to what David said, and I think um, it's relevant to the question of expanding is is that one thing that's really important about it is that they spend a lot of time cultivating relationships. And so we talk to other professors there and try and make it a collaborative process and one that's really positive for students. And so there was some hesitancy initially of even adding in FAMU. And so slowly, I think there would be others, but the idea is to make sure there's a strong relationship there. Um, but students are admitted to UC Davis and they have support and mentorship the whole, time um, through this program and they're there for the summer and then what does it help them apply to graduate school um, in the UC system and provides financial support for them um, with the idea that they can pursue it's focused on PhDs but they can pursue PhDs and then there's all kinds of other great opportunities in the UC system like the presidential um, postdoctoral fellowship and there I think there are a lot of that program is pretty phenomenal in, in its support, level of support, expertise, mentorship, and is a really great, provides great guidance for, for other programs that could be could be set up as well that were more focused on, on just the master's program. But they do support master's too. So the student that's coming to work with me is, is interested in a master's first, but interested in doing, like her goal is to become a professor. That's her long-term goal, so. Thank you, Beth. Um, there's a, a big piece in the, in the uh, Q&A from Deb Brenner, um, providing information about women of the vine and spirits and the scholarships that they offer. And those are listed in the Q&A. So be sure and copy that down, uh, everyone. Um, from an anonymous attendee, we have, thanks for this important conversation. Could any of the speakers address the issue of age diversity in recruiting in the vineyards and cellar lab careers? Some people have a first career and then try to switch into wine. And it seems to be very hard to get hired over 40 in this area. So, so I will say, and I don't know, Andy might have more to say on this as well. I, I will say that we do get a lot of non-traditional students in our programs. Um, transfer students will often have experience in the wine industry or some other industry. Uh, almost all of our master students have done something else in their career and come back. We have more non-traditional, and when I say non-traditional, I'm, I'm including older students in our programs than probably just about any program on campus, I would think, at least the ones that I've uh, taught in. And um, so it's, we're very used to training students who are um, older. Uh, 
you know, and they anecdotally, I'd say they seem to be getting jobs in the industry. Um, whether it's been harder for them or not, I, I don't know. I can't say, but it, but um, we are very used to to training students who are older. Andy, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Well, I think uh, our our graduates are going into uh, a management track, and there may not be as many issues with older older graduates there. I'm not sure. One of our uh, current students is finishing up, and he's definitely second career, had a full career elsewhere, and you know his he did an internship, and he's they they asked him to come back. Um, you know these, at least in management, having uh, experience and maturity are really valuable. <laughs> Maybe getting a tasting room spot is harder if you're uh, older. I don't know, but at least. Historically, I've never, I haven't seen any of our graduates uh, struggle to get employed, um, you know, with, with uh, you know, a prior career. Great, thank you, Andy. There's a question from Cesar that's a little bit different. Um, he says, I have a BA in general studies, but I worked in the wine business for 30 years. I worked as a seller master, assistant winemaker, winemaker, but I don't have the BA in winemaking. What kind of programs do you have for people like me with lots of experience, but no degree in winemaking? And um, I wondered about some of your um, continuing ed programs, Dave, or something like that. Um, did you want to quickly give us a little yeah, bit on I mean, that? We, we do have uh, several options. Of course, our master's degree is an option if you're able to go back to school full-time for two years. Um, we have a professional science master's program that actually is um, uh, doesn't require research, but it does have a mandatory um, internship in the second year, follow the second year. So those are both options. Um, but another really good option is our wine certificate program offered through uh, continuing professional education uh, in conjunction with our department. Um, and I know that Akimi has uh, is now funding several students going through that program in addition to our undergraduate and graduate programs. Maybe she can comment, comment on that as well. Yeah, uh, that program is absolutely amazing. We're here now today in Lodi on an enrichment trip. And I have three folks who are, one is actually one class away from completing that program. And I will tell you the winemakers here in Lodi have been at this for a long time. And the comment I got this morning was they are highly impressed and they asked all of them where they were going to school. And in unison, they said UC Davis. And um, it definitely is an impressive program. I got some great feedback from them. And um, I think that for someone that has already pursued education and may not have the aptitude to, or the time commitment to be back in their master's, this is a great opportunity for you. It's a great program. Great, thank you, Kimi. Um, the final question on the, Q&A is from Jack. Um, he admits that like most industries right now, wineries are struggling to find staff across the operations from vineyard workers, the hospitality staff, from sell seller workers to administrative positions. Many of these positions do not necessarily require a college degree. Do you guys have any ideas for how to reach a more diverse workforce, potentially outside of the university setting? And this would be much appreciated. And so I think Akimi might have some ideas. Uh, Julia, if you're still on, you might have some ideas as well. Akimi. I think it's a great time for you to reach out to organizations like ours. Look into the communities where you're located and find those local organizations. A lot of people who are not necessarily maybe looking for work, but looking for opportunities and utilizing resources in their community are reaching out to those organizations for help. And a lot of them have job boards. They're doing uh, job fairs, mentorship type fairs. I think that's the best way to go. I mean, that's our largest recruitment for us as an organization. We reach out to fellow organizations who are attracting people of color and we're able to advertise the work that we're doing. So I think that we need to think out the box of the norm of advertising on winejobs.com, no offense to them, but we need to really start to dig into communities that are close to us and figure out where people are attracting to and then go into those spaces to actually recruit because you'd be surprised how many people are actually looking for work and thinking that they're just not capable in the wine industry wouldn't want me, 
but they don't know about the opportunities that are available. So it's really about thinking outside the box to advertise what you're doing. I agree right. with Kimi. I agree with Akimi. We, we we post them on Black Wine Professionals whenever somebody sends somebody a job. And I mean, I, you know, one of the ways is social. I, I You know, social is a big mover as well. We send it in a newsletter, but also social because people are really moving on that. And also, if you're looking, to, I would say, um, I would love like, you know, I do a lot of Instagram live. If you're looking for jobs and you want to like talk about your your winery needing help, like let's let's get like social and make it fun and actually present it in a different way. And I'm like, Akimi, wine jobs are is great, but a lot of people don't even know. A lot of people in the industry don't even know of that website. So if the people in the industry don't know, then trying to recruit somebody that's not in the industry is gonna be a little harder as well. Okay, and so we're up. Thank you so much, Julia and Akimi. We're we're now at the time where we need to, to take a little bit of a break. But I am going to ask if um, our panelists can answer the last two questions in the Q&A by typing in the answers. One is about how do you convert wine students into wine owners? And Dave, I know you have um, some work you're doing with the Graduate School of Management um, about this business component. So, and then I think Julia uh, and Akimi can help answer that as well. And then um, big question, what exchange programs does UCD have with other countries? And I'm assuming that they're asking about around wine making and wineries. So I'm thinking uh, Chile, Argentina, et cetera. So maybe Dave, you can put in uh, a little bit about that. And so we're going to take a break and we're going to come back at 1025. You don't need to completely sign out. I'll just, just, just uh, take your video off and your, mute your sound and stay with us. And we'll see you um, at 10.25. So it's only just enough time to run and get a cup of coffee or use uh, the restroom. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on this first panel discussion. And we'll see you at 10.25.
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Anita Oberholster, or Anita Oberholster, if I say it the way it's in South Africa. Um, I'm the Corporate Extension Specialist in Enology, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator for the next panel. Um, because I don't want to be responsible for putting us behind schedule, I'm just going to start and hope that everybody is back. That's a disadvantage of not seeing people in the room. Um, I would like to thank my panel first for actually being willing to speak about what their individual organizations have been doing and are doing to enhance um, diversity, equity and inclusion in their own environments. It's, you know, it's hard sometimes to put yourself on the spotlight. So first, our first panel member, I'm going to read this, I don't want to get anybody's titles wrong is uh, Michaelo Aguero. He's the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Jackson Family Wines. Welcome, Marcelo. Good morning, good morning. Or good afternoon, I think some folks are on the East Coast. So yeah, very, very happy to be here today. Um, so um, I asked you to share in a quick five to seven minutes. Yep. Um, what you are doing and uh, that will leave us plenty of time for questions and everybody else that will have anything that we want to ask in the Q&A, please go ahead. Perfect. I'm going to share my presentation here. Give me one second. Absolutely. Let's get this up and going here. <clears throat> and let me know if you can see this just so I'm... It looks good. All right. Perfect. Then we'll, we'll shoot. We'll, sh we'll, we'll get started. So... I oh, just put it in presenter mode. Sorry. Okay. Let me let me make sure. Let me give that a shot here. Let's see here. Is it showing up properly? Uh, we're seeing your uh, presenter mode. It's not showing the um, full screen. Let's try something else here. Let me try this one more time. Is it showing up properly now or not? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Good. Then, then I guess we're in good shape. So, um, yeah, I'll run through this uh, quickly and kind of high spot what we're doing at Jackson Family Wines. And I, I wanted to echo what Julia Coney said earlier this morning. I mean, the term I've been using around our building is it's a journey that never ends. Uh, and it is very, very true. When we first started to embark on this, the other term that really resonated with me, because we, we worked with a consultant early on just to make sure we were heading down the right path. And the, the term she used was get comfortable being uncomfortable. And I thought it was a great term. And I thought it really resonated because you do have to have those tough conversations. So um, I'll, I'll walk you through kind of what we're doing and then happy to answer any questions. So uh, is it advancing, Anita? Can you see the next slide? Perfect. Okay, I just want to make sure. So, so this was the statement that we as an organization put out last summer. Um, and it really was one of our core values take responsibility to cultivate a better future. And that starts by saying racism and violence have no place in this world. We must come together as a community and stand in solidarity to fight injustice and equality with a hashtag we must do better. So that was the statement that we put out. And I think this, it was, it was really interesting. We put the statement out uh, right after the George Floyd events and it, it, the statement was good, but it, to be quite honest and, and just being transparent, it fell a little short as that week and the months kind of moved forward. So I was gonna be upfront about that. This was the public statement that we put out and a lot of us um, afterwards felt like maybe we should have even taken a bigger position than we did at the time. So just sharing this with you. And then I'll share with you some of the, the work that we're doing from that point forward. So what we've done um, really in the fall of last year is as an organization, we created a, a DNI steering committee and we have a couple of uh, executive sponsors. I'm one of them. And then one of our owners is also, uh, Katie Jackson is one of our uh, executive sponsors. And one thing that we realized in doing some work and research is that if you don't have alignment with ownership and the executive team, it's going to be hard to implement something throughout the organization. And we kind of refer to that, that term as tone at the top. So we went out and did executive interviews and ownership interviews. And the one thing that we realized is that where there was some heightened awareness that was transpiring last fall, uh, there was a collective agreement that neutrality really was not an option. 
And then there was kind of the identification that as an organization, we've done some good work in this space, but we really need to do more and formalize the process. We do a lot of things kind of soft and we needed to, to really make a statement. So um, what we did is we've done, a, we've done a few different things. We kind of action an employee-based diversity and inclusion council. Uh, we put that entire group through unconscious bias training. There's a lot of us in the organization have gone through that, but we put this a team of about 25 employee based group through that. And then we've identified some areas of focus for us as an organization, which I'll share with all of you. Um, the other thing that we're in the midst of concluding right now is we've done a company wide diversity and inclusion survey. So we are in the middle of that. Uh, our employees have until June 9th to complete that. We sent it out about a week and a half ago, but we're doing a, a full company wide survey on diversity and inclusion that we've worked with a consultant on. And for us, it's level setting and it's hearing from our employee base about what they feel we're doing well, what are some areas of opportunity, and just to kind of get a real understanding and tone from, from our employee base. So uh, the other thing we did is we interviewed a, a, about 10 or 15 different consultants and we ended up hiring the Institute for Sustainable Diversity and Inclusion. So we've worked really closely with them on creating kind of our framework and our strategy and our training plan. And then we're identifying some measures and reporting and some goals that we're going to set for our organization. So um, the other thing they've been really good about for us is they've done executive and employee, or excuse me, uh, ownership interviews on readiness to do this work. And that was really eye-opening for a lot of people to really have really candid discussions about where they stand and where, and where they want to go. And then we're, we're putting that whole team through about 12 hours of different training on context and competency in this space, because we really felt it's important for them to be able to speak to it and know exactly what the company goals and objectives are so we can cascade that down throughout the employee base and the leadership group. Um, our employee council has been, been really good too. We've got 24 individuals in this organization from the organization. It's a diverse group of backgrounds and experiences, and it's about 14 different departments. So we want to make sure that we have a voice from a lot of different departments. Uh, so that includes you know, digital, DTC, finance, human resources, IT, marketing, sales, vineyards. And the other thing is it's a really strong um, mix of primary measures such as gender, age, um, ethnicity, race, and other core contributes or attributes. So we feel like we've got a really good diverse uh, representation on our, on our employee council. And we really feel that this group is going to be a good collective voice on sharing ideas and kind of helping us move our goals and objectives forward and hopefully inspire a new way of thinking as we kind of kind of move forward into this new era. Um, areas of focus for us as an organization, you know, we are looking at employee recruitment and how we can do that a little differently and hopefully a little bit better. So we are looking at some of the uh, colleges and general recruiting efforts, looking at specific programs and where we can kind of improve and aid our efforts. We have a college recruiting team, uh, but we're starting to look at that with a, with a DNI lens. Uh, we're looking at strategic internships and production and farming, which we have been doing, but looking at enhancing that and adding a different lens to it. Uh, and even, even taking a step back on vendor selection process and, and making sure that we're stepping back and looking at that through a DNI lens. Uh, mentorship process, and then DNI and unconscious bias training. And uh, that was an interesting uh, comment from earlier because I oversee the direct to consumer business for, for our organization. And I think Julia mentioned it. And we are in the midst right now of actually putting our entire direct to consumer team, hospitality and culinary team, over 100 people. Uh, through unconscious bias training. And they're going to go through that because as we reopen and more people come back to the um, come back to the tasting rooms, we kind of feel like unconscious bias training is a good level set to make people more aware and heighten their own education on biases they may have and not even know they have. So we're really looking forward to doing that training with them. And then um, some other things we need to go back and look at with this, with our internal team and, and, and with this new lens is a lot of things like our internal company statements and handbooks and how we onboard people. So we're looking at that as some of the key areas of focus for us as a company. And then um, other things we do is we've got a program called Rooted for Good at the company where we give employees paid time off to go uh, do community outreach and, and um, do work in the community. So we're looking at volunteerism and looking at you know, what are some other community projects that we can work on? We've historically done and worked at food banks or worked at uh, animal shelters, those type of things, um, to give you an example, or we've done some environmental stuff like help 
you know, rebuild streams and those type of things. But we want to start seeing what more can we do from a diversity and inclusion standpoint with this rooted for good platform that we've had for several years. And then other things are just scholarship opportunities, looking at our organization and where can we help support scholarships um, in the BIPOC space. Currently, we're one of the founders of the BIPOC scholarship at, at Cal Poly. And we also have, uh, for the last couple of years, supported 10,000 degrees as well. But we are looking at this much closer. And these are a couple that we do now, but what else can we do? And then, uh, you know, the big things for us as, as a company is secure allyship across the organization on this initiative that we're working on. Uh, look at some soft goals based on action items and benchmarks. Um, we've put a couple of people in the organization through the uh, Cornell um, Extended Education Certification Program for DNI. So we've got some folks doing that as well. And then uh, working with this consultant that's been really, really good for us is looking at what are those goals and what are those measures? Because what, what does success look like? That's what we're trying to define right now as well as an organization. So um, those are some of the areas of focus that we have right now. Um, and like I said, we're in the midst of doing our employee survey, which I think is gonna be very eye-opening for all of us. And it's a chance for our employees to kind of share their voice and their opinions. Uh, the other thing that we've shared out with the, with the teams here is just some groups and organizations so that people can get more comfortable with um, what's out there. So this is kind of a list of some websites that we've recommended. So the Kimi, I, you know, the Roots Fund is part of the, one of the groups that we've got identified on there to just help with people's education. And then the other thing that we shared out with our teams was just reference materials, just what are some other web based resources to get more comfortable with, you know, bias in the workplace, looking at white fragility, looking at microaggressions, um, you know, all those type of things. So, and then we recommended some books too for people. So that's just a, a few slides to share with kind of what we're working on here as an organization and uh, more than happy to answer any questions at, at this point, Anita. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, we're going to finish all the go through all the panel members and then we'll see how much time is left over uh, yeah. to make sure that everybody gets equal chance to answer all the questions. That sounds great. I mean, I think um, you're showing that Jackson Family Wines is really trying to have a whole company buy in into this very important issue and a lot of um, education and helping people be good citizens. I think that's really important. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with more. That's exactly what our goal is. And it's, it's going to be a process. And uh, we're doing a lot of good work, but we've got a lot of work to do ahead of us. So yeah, our lifetime and the next lifetime. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I think we're all going to uh, quote um, Julia from now on. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's really true. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to our next um, speaker or panel member as Michelle Novi. Uh, Michelle Novi is here to represent the Napa Valley Witness. She's the Industry Relations and Regulatory Affairs Director for Napa Valley Witness. Thank you very much for being with us, Michelle. Thank you so much, Anita, and thank you to the entire UC Davis team that put this together and all of the panelists and all of the people that are tuning in. Um, this is a, it's an honor to be a part of such an important conversation. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the Napa Valley Vintners is doing and where our focus um, is in this conversation. And um, much like Jackson Family Wines, um, we have a lot going on internally, but I would say that um, our areas of focus have really been education, mentorship, and hopefully leading by example. And so in the education space, I think we all recognize that the wine industry is incredibly specialized and a nuanced field and that uh, education really is the access point um, for this field in, in, in many ways, um, you know, from viticulture and enology to, to wine business. Um, having that background or at least some, some educational training uh, is a great entry point. And we're so lucky to have incredible institutions um, from community colleges. Um, I loved the discussion that was happening around community colleges because I'm a transfer student myself from Santa Rosa JC to UC Davis. Um, but from community colleges all the way up to graduate programs, 
uh, you know, we're recognizing that value. And as an organization, we have very deep roots in supporting education, particularly in our community through auction Napa Valley funding that we were able to raise for nearly 40 years. And so now we're really kind of turning our attention to how do we support education from the industry perspective um, and, and broadening that community there. Um, and so we, as an organization, have a 75 year history and we were, um, it made a lot of sense for us to partner with an organization that also had a long history and very deep roots um, in the education space. Uh, so last year we were able to announce a partnership with the United Negro College Fund to provide uh, scholarships for wine education um, of $1 million over five years. And so really excited to be, be able to, to do that. Um, but also, you know, uh, looking to at the mentorship aspect, uh, that's been very important to us. And I think several of the panelists talked about, um, I think it was Akimi who talked about, um, it's not just scholarships, it's that mentorship and wanting to, to kind of, you know, hold the hand while you go through the process. Um, and so we have um, also dedicated significant financial support uh, to several nonprofits who have deep knowledge, um, strong leadership, and um, robust mentorship framework. So that's programs like Wine Unify, uh, Batonage Forum, and the Roots Fund, um, where we can, um, separate from the, the education piece, but the, the kind of professional side, support that mentorship, which we also know is so critical in our industry. Um, and then the last piece I, I'll just touch on is the, the leading by example. And uh, I think Marcelo uh, talked about, you know, providing resources. Um, on June 16th of last year, uh, we held a listen and learn session for our membership um, with um, our community coming together and listening to Black voices and share their experience of uh, being a part of our wine community and uh, how we do, in fact, just need to do better. Um, and so from there, we have internally been, you know, revising our, you know, employee manual, our policies, but also our, you know, mission and values to make sure that we are reflecting um, internally and externally a message um, that is, you know, what we, <laughs> what we care about, um, and that is, diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And so making that um, very public to our team here, but also um, outward facing. Uh, the other piece that I wanna touch on and just the leading by example is we took a really hard look at our uh, marketing and promotions materials. You know, As the voice for the Napa Valley, um, we were looking at how we were portraying the Napa Valley and it, was being portrayed very, uh, you know, it was a, a very narrow group. Um, and so we have made sure that um, all of our, you know, images and messages are reflective of a welcoming environment because that's what we want to be. Um, I think uh, Julia kind of touched on it earlier is this sense of um, wanting to be included and belonging. That's just a natural human <laughs> need is, is to belong. Um, and so we want to make sure that every aspect of our marketing promotions, but also our internal committees, uh, reflect the diversity that we are championing. So we kicked off a new uh, Napa leadership program this year to really inspire our next generation of leaders for the Valley. And it was 80% women and um, incredibly diverse. And it was just really wonderful to see, um, you know, all of these people kind of stepping up, raising their hands and saying, I wanna be, you know, a future leader. Uh, and, and, you know, that is what the Napa Valley will look like, um, you know, from, from here on out, I think. We're also uh, just in terms of our own team, 
looking at uh, examining our relationships to power and privilege. So we're working with a leading um, diversity company to really kind of take that hard look at, at our biases and how we're operating as a team. Um, and we're going to be extending the, those types of resources to our, to our members um, here on out. I think I'll just end with kind of the takeaways for us, at least so far, is that everything needs to be in alignment. Um, what you are saying externally needs to be reflected in your internal practices, and, and there needs to be uh, an integrity of, of what you're saying. It's not just checking a box. This is uh, lifelong work, and it's incredibly important. Um, the other piece is to identify your values as an organization and make those your areas of focus. So for the NVV, we have a long history with education and mentorship and being leaders. And so that's where we wanted to put our energy. We wanted to focus that energy where we could make the most impact and support and lift up um, other organizations that are already doing incredible work. We don't need to recreate the wheel, but we can uh, support, support those that are already doing incredible things. So um, I'll stop there, but thank you again for including me in the conversation. Thank you, Michelle. I mean, you said two things that um, jumped out at me. I mean, Napa Valley Witness have been doing good work in this space for, for a long time, but it's always good to refocus. And what I really liked is when you mentioned that you know, um, actually talking to the communities you're trying to help and seeing if you're giving the help that the way that actually is receivable, right? And, and can be more effective. Uh, I think sometimes you, you, you see it out of your lens, you need to see it out of a different lens. The same with marketing. Um, actually looking at different lenses and see, is it as, actually as welcoming as you think uh, from your perspective? Really, really important. Thank you very much, Michelle. Our last panel member is uh, Jeff O'Neill. So Jeff O'Neill is the CEO of uh, Neil Witness and Distillers. Welcome, Jeff. I think Thanks, uh, Anita. Karen Great. is going to share a slide that you prepared. Yeah, that there would be great. We go. Thank, thank you, Karen. Nice to be here. Great to hear from you, Gary and Helene, and uh, everybody's thoughts, and Dave and your whole group. and. Thanks for organizing it and, and, and including me. Um, so I'll just give you, you know, kind of a little top line summary as to how O'Neill thinks about it. Um, but I think, you know, fundamentally, uh, look, the whole DEI issue is really about an attitude. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's just critical that uh, it's from the top down. And uh, so that's kind of the way we have thought about it. Um, we're probably a little bit more rudimentary than, than some companies about how we've thought about it. But um, I sent my notes to our, our CMO, who happens to be a woman uh, from Guatemala. And of course, she first thing, and it had mostly to do with BIPOC. So of course, the first thing she said to me was, wait a second, there's, you know, gender and, and we're, we're very active in, you know, you know, uh, supporting a number of folks uh, in our industry. And uh, so just a tiny bit of background, it, uh, I did get a statistic. So we, uh, we are 45% women at O'Neill um, with 40 uh, in leadership roles. And that's out of 300, you know, uh, plus or minus. So we're pretty active in that space. And, uh, and then a, as a winery in California, uh, a, about 60% of our team uh, identifies as uh, other than Caucasian. So, um, you know, I think our, in general, we're pretty diversified. Can we do more? Absolutely. Um, and I think what brought for us, when we started thinking about, you know, real diversity um, and looking at what our industry looks like, whether it's uh, production, wholesale, marketing, sales, you name it, um, you know, as I think Gary mentioned earlier, um, you know, I, the industry has a lot to do. And uh, over the years, I've made no, numerous contributions to organizations that, you know, you know, make some great, great efforts. But I, I wanted to really talk to our team and, and find out how do they think we should approach it. And, and, and I wanted to see real change. I wanted to see measurable change. And um, 
one of the things that I think we see as we see all of this, it kind of comes in waves where, you know, there's a situation like the Floyd killing and then everybody, you know, jumps out, writes a manifesto. I figured I wasn't a good enough writer. So I thought I didn't want to write a manifesto about what our company policy and then, and then publish it. I said to our organization, what can we do and what can we prove? What is actionable and what is measurable? And, and that's how we have, we have thought about it. And then we said, okay, where is the biggest need? And, and if you look at our industry, um, the African-American community is, is just not represented. Um, well, I mean, it's less than 1%, it might be one and a half percent. I know it, it, is a, it is a very, very, very small number. So as I said, we wanted to do something that was significant. And um, um, what we did was we did a town hall and we did a town hall with this probably, I'd say three months or two months after the Floyd uh, killing. And um, so we talked to all 300 and, you know, my team knows I'm passionate about this uh, issue. And um, the, the, they jumped in with, you know, all four feet and, um, so we put together a group that, that was gonna just do an analysis around where, where could O'Neill make a significant change? And we decided that was education. And then we said, okay, what are we gonna do in education? So we said, well, let's start putting scholarships together. And what does that look like? Well, that looks like a scholarship that I was always concerned. And again, no offense to anybody on the phone because I think every contribution makes a lot of sense, but I wanted to follow it because over the years, I, my contributions to a lot of organization, it gets lost. And you really don't know 100% where it's going. So we said, look, we're going to support for the first year, we're going to support uh, two uh, African American students um, with 100% scholarship. So that included, you know, room and board, uh, and of course, tuition. And we said, okay, let's try to figure out how to make that happen. And, and so, so that's what we did. And our team came back with just amazing recommendations. But it's not only the scholarship, we want to uh, have mentors. Uh, and we want to have internships available. And then we want to make sure that those students can come through and they can come into the industry and they can come in, you know, they can come in through O'Neill, they can, but, but they will leave this, uh, they, they will graduate with the tools uh, of the, being totally capable in our industry. And then they can go anywhere. They can go to a wholesaler, they can go to a marketing department, they can go to winemaking. So we've done two so far. We've done one at Cal Poly, which is really about enology and viticulture. And we've done one at Sonoma State. And we just awarded both of them um, uh, in the last week. So we're, we're really excited about that. And, and I know not everybody in our industry can, um, uh, can, can fully fund to 100% scholarships, but but we're going to continue to do that every year, um, and then we want to watch that. and And I, I just believe it's if we when we can start pointing and measuring and saying, look, this is the action that we took, that we will ultimately be very proud of that, and and it will actually you know uh, bring a number of other people into the industry. So um, a couple of other just high points uh, on what we do about uh, I don't know about three and a half years ago, I partnered with Charles Woodson. You can see him in the in the, in the photo there, he's the Heisman Trophy winner that found his way to the Napa Valley um, during uh, uh, Raider spring training and uh, fell in love with red wine and then started his own small winery. And, and then we had the opportunity to partner with, um, with Charles. And then I, I was able to, to lean on him because I think having you know, mentors in the industry are just so critical um, to the success of our scholarship. So, so it's, he's jumped on board and, and we call it the, the O'Neill uh, Woodson Scholarship. And a couple of more very quick points. Uh, Julia, I think, you know, hit the nail on the head. We need to start talking to these new customers. Who are they? You know, diversifying our social media feed. Um, you know, at, at O'Neill, I mean, we're, at, we're trying to look at how do we market to these uh, communities, whether it's, I mean, we know that the Hispanic community in California is going to be 40% and then uh, and in Texas is, is 40%. And, and the African-American community as well, we have not, I don't think we've talked actively to any of these communities properly. And, and I, I will tell you, one of the great examples is that we're understanding now, and just this is just data, I, I don't have any particular inside, but, but for example, the brand 19 Crimes launched a brand called Cali Red, and they did it through uh, Snoop's Instagram account, basically, and and uh, marketing, and and now they're going to sell a million cases this year, 
and and it has brought in thousands of new drinkers that that probably never thought of me. I don't, I don't know. It's just it, it was just great that we were speaking with a social media um, to a community that I think, you know, we have a tendency to uh, ignore. So I think, look, I think for the industry, there's a lot. Um, so in, in closing, and I know Anita wanted me to just come up with a couple of, you know, bullet points. Um, the first thing that I think is most important, talk to your teams. If you're in the industry and you're on this call, talk to your teams. You will be astounded as to what they say to you and how they're thinking and what, you know, not just young people, but largely this, you know, I'll call it the, you know, the Gen Z, the millennials, um, they, they have a lot to say, let me tell you. And, and you've got to be listening um, at the top. And then I think the second thing is large or small, actionable and measurable uh, makes a huge amount of sense. So let's just, you know, figure out whatever, if you're going to give money, give it great, but try to follow it all the way through. Um, and, uh, you know, and with that, um, you, you know, I, oh, so I mean, I guess, I guess lastly, we, we also, we, we have formed a, you know, we have this great, uh, a committee or team, uh, internally looking at this and, and, um, and, and every, one of the, I guess really the second thing besides education was, you know, can we have time off to go work in communities of need? And the answer to that, of course, is, is yes. So we also, and like, I think a lot of people have. Uh, time off, paid time off um, to, to work in some of these high need communities. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I mean, very valuable. I mean, I, I knew each of the panel is going to bring a little bit of a different perspective to what they're doing and what other people can do and so they can see what in their own environment they can apply. Something that you said that's really important is about Anybody that can contribute, it's really, really important. Please do the little bit you can. But giving 100% scholarships, I mean, I'm from South Africa, and that's the problem that we've had. Um, a lot of the students come from very difficult socioeconomic circumstances. And basically, they need 100% support because it's already the cards are stacked against them to be successful in this academic environment. And then if they still have to do a part-time job, to be fully funded so that they can focus on their studies. It just makes it so much more difficult for these kids to succeed. And so, yeah, yeah. so that's a really, I completely really important agree. point. Yeah, yeah. So, that's exactly why we did it. You know, obviously we'd like to do a hundred of them, but, um, but, but again, you know, I, w what I want to do is really test and see, let's, let's just make it work. And then, then I think we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have a you know, pretty robust program. Yes, so we ran out of time. This is where everybody's cameras is on. I know this is Caroline's way to tell me, Anita, you're out of time. I'm always out of time. I would have loved to ask all the panel members questions. I'm gonna say, Marcelo, there is a question in the Q&A. If you could perhaps type in an answer, I would be really grateful. Um, and we will try, anybody thinks of questions, I will make sure the panel gets it and we will um, send you answers via email. Thank you very much. Great. Oh, Thanks. and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was supposed I'm supposed to pass it back to Dave because Dave is the moderator for the next panel. <laughs> no problem, Anita. Thank you. Um, so that, that was great information from various parts of industry on what, what some companies are doing and thinking about. Um, we thought it would be actually very interesting to take another, uh, to look at uh, what's going on in industry from kind of another angle as well. And so I have a panel of alumni from UC Davis uh, with me today. So thank you all of you for, for joining. Um, so I'll introduce the panel and then we'll, we'll hear a little bit about um, their experiences in, at UC Davis and their careers. So joining me today is Kale Anderson, who's the owner and consulting winemaker for Kale Consulting. Victoria Coleman, who's the winemaker for Lobo Wines. Miguel Luna, who's the vice president of Estate Vineyards for Silverado Farming Company. And Corinne Rich, who's the co-founder and winemaker for Bird Horse Wine. So thank you all of you for joining us. And I, I've asked um, each of the panelists to, to kind of think about and answer kind of the following prompt is, tell us about the opportunities and challenges that you found not only in your education at UC Davis, but as you entered and matured in the industry. And so I think we'll, we'll go one at a time and then hopefully there'll be a little bit of time at the end for questions, but certainly you can uh, write your questions in the Q&A as well. 
And um, I think in no particular order, maybe we'll start with Kale. Hi, thanks so much for having me, uh, Dr. Block. And thank you so much for having me on this, uh, on this great topic, uh, on this great Zoom here. So I, um, I, I, I wanted to not take up too much time, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, my, my wine story. Uh, because it's deeply intertwined with uh, UC Davis. So um, let me start by saying that, you know, I'm, I'm, a, a, mix, I, I'm a mixed race. I'm Filipino American and um, uh, on my mother's side and, and, um, and my wife is also mixed race and we're both alumni uh, 2002. Um, uh, I, I, I would like to just tell the story a little bit because I think there's a lot of positive things that uh, we could learn from the from my story. Because um, you know my wine story started at UC Davis, so I was born in San Diego and grew up in Sonoma County, in the middle of the industry, uh, completely oblivious to uh, to wine. Um, growing up in Sonoma County, um, and I went to UC Davis as a pre med student um, at 18 years old. Um, and um, it was at Davis that somehow I stumbled upon the wine industry. And, and, and I think it, it's a great lesson to, you know, the faculty and to the, to the student body, as well as to, um, you know, administrators. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I, I'm a success story um, uh, because uh, Davis provided me space uh, to discover myself and discover my love of wine. Um, I was, you know, under 21 when I, when I was bit by the wine book. Um, I was uh, working uh, one summer at, uh, in the Murphy Plant Biology Lab, uh, where Mark Krasnow was the, um, was one of the PhD students there. And he realized that I couldn't stand uh, pipetting all day and uh, encouraged me to uh, check out the Viticulture and Enology program. Um, and I was able to uh, discover the wine program and uh, discover my love of wine uh, when I wasn't even 21 yet. Um, so it was in this space where uh, this safe uh, environment that I was able to foster my love of the wine industry. Um, fast forward, I mean, this is my 21st, this will be my 21st vintage in the wine industry. Uh, you know, I'm a winery owner. Um, uh, multiple businesses uh, that I have in the wine industry, and it had to do with uh, uh, being mentored, uh, doing great internships, and being able to um, find my way uh, in a in a safe place. That was that was Davis. Um, you know, uh, I, I started Kale Wines in 2008, started the consulting business in 2016, and making multiple wines for multiple wineries now. Um, and uh, it was this safe place at Davis where someone under 21 uh, without uh, any um, experience with wine on the table when I was growing up uh, to, uh, to, to get into this business. So, um, you know, I, I, I think um, I was lucky uh, to, to be mentored as well as um, be trusted uh, you know, I think there's a lot of ageism in the wine industry. Uh, you know, that was not the case at, at Davis uh, where I was welcomed with open arms uh, into the program. And, you know, people were, I think, maybe a little bit baffled that um, someone like me was in the wine industry or wanted to be in the wine industry, at, you know, under 21 and at, uh, and at UC Davis. But I feel like, um, you know, Dr. Block and, the rest of the uh, staff was uh, very welcoming, and uh, and I and I was able to continue that into the industry, um, uh, you know, relatively you know successfully. So um, so I want to say thank you to the university uh, for for giving me this opportunity and uh, discover myself. So thank you. Yeah, and it, it is somewhat as someone like I said before who didn't grow up with with wine as part of our kind of family culture and history, you know, it, it is interesting to figure out how, how do we get to, 
to people like you or me to explain to them that this could be an important career choice for them. So I definitely appreciate that. Victoria, would you would you like to speak next? Sure. Hi, hi, Kale and Miguel. I know those two, so they're on my screen. Um, thanks for having me as well. Uh, my story. Um, I come from Seattle, Washington, and I come from a family of cocktail drinkers and not wine drinkers. So when I moved to Napa, I was studying computer science and just waiting for residency. I ended up working at Stag's Leaf Wine Cellars, just temporarily moved into production. I was there for a few years before I figured out, I knew I wasn't into computers any longer, but I thought if I stay, this is what I'll do. I'll get into viticulture. I think I, I was stronger on the viticultural side, um, just in the vineyard, just being a part of that rather than uh, winemaking. And so when I decided I would do this, I was like, I have to go to Davis. So it's like a, a dream. And I knew that I'd get there and it took me a while. So I worked in the wine industry about five years before being able to get into Davis, but it was difficult for me just because I was, I was already making wine by the time I was at Davis. And so I was commuting from St. Helena and I had like a foot in the vineyard, a foot in the cellar. And then like my mind is at UC Davis, but so I didn't have that interaction that you need with other students. You know, you kind of, that's part of the learning experience. And after graduating in 2008, I went to France for a harvest and coming back, it was just, I found myself kind of in the same situation because not many people were hiring. So I just ended up taking on small projects and just, so it was almost like being on my own, learning on my own, tasting on my own. And you kind of have to build your own network. And so some of the people that I did meet at Davis were like lifelong friends now. Um, can call them for anything. I have friends that were in Davis prior that I can call on, but it was just a different experience for me. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I think establishing a network, no matter what field, but certainly in viticulture and analogy is, is absolutely critical. And um, we've thought a lot about, you know, how can we help that happen while students are still at Davis? But I mean, obviously there's a lot more that we can do and connecting them to people like you, alumni from the program. Uh, Miguel, would you like to go next? Um, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really proud to be in this panel uh, with all these people that I admire and, and, and it's just it's a great honor. Um, my story is somewhat similar to Victoria's where when I was at Davis, I was also commuting from Napa every day. Um, the question about what was the challenges and opportunities, I think uh, growing up in, in St. Helena, my, my father has been working in the vineyards of Napa since 1968. So, you know, I did my first harvest in the vineyards when I was 14 years old. I used to go to work since I was 16. Um, and, and as, as uh, Dr. Waterhouse mentioned earlier, you know, it's 90% of the people doing the work are, are speaking Spanish or, mostly from Mexico. And one of the things I noticed is that there was, there was a ceiling if I didn't have an education. You know, it's probably seller master or a vineyard manager, and that, that's as far as we're gonna get uh, for, for people of, of uh, Mexican descent. So when I decided that I wanted to go into do this for a living and, and, and do winemaking and build culture, um, I knew that I needed an education. And I knew that Davis was that's, and, uh, similar to Victoria. You know, it took me five years at the Napa College to be able to transfer. Uh, so I had been working for years in the industry before I went to Davis. And I knew that at, when I, once I was at Davis, I knew I was there to learn and, and go back to work. Um, I also did a harvest in France after, after Davis. And um, it's difficult for children of, of first generation children to know how to navigate the school system. Uh, you know, your parents are working all the time and they assume 
that the school is taking care of everything and it's not necessarily when you're in high school, that's not the truth all the time. Um, so I think we, we need to educate the parents on what they can do to make sure that their kids are being prepared for college. Because uh, the, the reason I was in, in a junior college for five years is because I pretty much went to high school again at a junior college. You know, the classes I took when I were, were in, was in high school were easy, high school, easy classes because I was an old mature kid and all I wanted to do was play sports and, and have a GPA that was good enough for that. So, you know, when your parents are working a lot um, and they don't know how the system works, they assume that the school is taking care of it. And so I think educating those kids and educating the parents on, on what their kids need to do to be prepared and to, to go to a four-year college and, and to move on, that's kind of one of the responsibilities we have now. Um, it's, it's, um, it's not easy, but I think it's, it's very important. And it's one of those things where scholarships are great, but uh, it's not just throwing money at it. You know, uh, We have to be educating people. And in my mind, education is the only way to, to be more inclusive in an industry. Um, just my two cents on that. No, that's, that's a great point. I mean, I, I think about, you know, my, in my family, you know, my parents were the first generation to go to college, and that meant that they had so much more knowledge when I was applying of what to do or not to do. And then, you know, I think about my kids who, my own children who have, you know, a college professor as a father, and that's the, you know, we don't really think about on a daily basis that we're, you know, steering kids in a certain direction when it comes to what courses they choose in high school or what advice do they do they get in high school to make sure they're ready for UC or CSU or community college or whatever. And it's that it, I, I think, you know, your point of educating parents is is huge and, and doing it in a way that they're going to understand and appreciate careers in viticulture and knology for their, for their children. It's really important. There's also something about educating, and that's, I guess we have to do that to our parents is, uh, you know, like when you're a kid of immigrants that worked in the vineyards, they're teaching you that you have to do better, right? So, so get out of the vineyards and, and work in something else. But I think we need to educate people to, to, so they know that working, there's great opportunities in the vineyards. There's great room to grow and to be successful. And you know you don't have to work in an office to be a successful parent, a uh, successful person. That the vineyards are great, and all LGBT culture. There, there's just room for success. And uh, to, since we're the ones, uh, and by we I mean people of color are doing all the work, we should also be represented in, in positions of power. Yeah, that's absolutely. It's a, you know that's the E and D E I, the equity of of uh, what what we're talking about. So yeah, I very much appreciate that comment. Uh, Corinne? Uh, um, thanks so much for having me today. It's great to see all of you. It's our pleasure to have all of you. Um, yeah, my, my journey in the wine industry really started out uh, working in the wine industry. I'm originally from Sonoma County, California. Um, my parents have no connection to wine other than being very enthusiastic consumers. Uh, but when I was moving back with an analytical chemistry degree in my early 20s, just kind of looking for a job, found out wineries needed help in their laboratories during the harvest season. And that's kind of where it all began. I started in the lab, I moved to the cellar um, and I did what so many young people do in this industry. I worked the harvest circuit for years. I bounced back and forth hemispheres. I got jobs in tasting rooms uh, and that all eventually led me to UC Davis um, where I met my now partner, Katie. Um, and we have our brand for Bush Wines together. Uh, but I think one of the greatest challenges I faced along the way, um, as we're talking about DEI today, um, is as a queer person, every time you go somewhere new, you have to come out again, right? Uh, it sounds a little bit cheesy, but we, you know, coming out is not a single event, it's a lifelong process. And so every time I enter a new workspace, I have to, or when I'm applying for jobs even, I have to think, you know, is it safe for me here? Is this a good place for me? Are people going to support me? Um, and I know a lot of people's initial reaction to that can sometimes be, well, you know, your personal business is your personal business and you can keep that to yourself. But this is a small industry that is built largely on mentorship and personal relationships, right? Like your personal life doesn't stay entirely forever. 
personal. It is intimately interwoven with your coworkers a lot of the time. And so it's really difficult to sort of assess those things. Um, you know, your, your first day on the dock because it's not intuitive and it's, and it's not obvious. Um, and so I think one of the most important things for me as I've, you know, worked my way up the ranks has been, I always say that for, for queer folks, it's not enough to be visible. We have to be audible. Because uh, when you look, walk into a room, you can't identify, like, you can't identify queer people in a room, right? We are just sort of like the invisible minority. It's not obvious who we are. Um, and allyship is also something that you can't immediately identify. It is something that comes from actions and from words. And so I think it's become so important for me to not only be like, you know, seen for what I am, but to also not be afraid to sort of tell people and, and be very clear that like, hey, I'm trans, this is my life, this is my partner. Like, you are welcome here. You are safe here. This is a good place for you to be for three hundred folks who are entering the industry now. Great. Thank you, all of you. So we have some um, interesting uh, questions in the in the Q&A. And, &A, and um, this is one that I'll post to, to all of you. Um, looking, looking back, would you have wanted a student group that served as a safe space to support you? Do you have any ideas how to create a group like that for students now? I mean, I think it's, I'll just, I'll start. Um, I think it's great to have groups like that because I think it gives you a sense of community a lot of the time, which is really great. And there, that, that feeling of shared experience is really powerful and impactful for a lot of people. And particularly if those groups can be tied to mentorship too, right? I feel like that's something where anybody who's had a mentor um, has appreciated so much. I think the only thing about them sometimes that, requires a bit of delicacy is inherently by creating those groups sometimes they can be othering in a way and so it, I, I think as you're creating them you just have to be really thoughtful about the messaging of them from, from my perspective Great. other thoughts on that from your experiences um i have an ad, uh, i was a member of uh, devo um, and uh, I, that, that was a, a great organization uh, for me to be a part of. I've gone back to Davis and spoke to Devo on multiple occasions, and um, I thought that was really supportive of, uh, of me because it was uh, the students um, supporting each other, um, you know, from very different backgrounds, and I think that was very inclusive uh, for me, and, and it was also a space where we could uh, share experiences of, you know, challenges and uh, and uh, um, and successes. So, um, you know, I, I I think that was uh, for from my experience that that was a great organization um, that really helped to you know. And I still have lots of friends uh, who were you know that I that I made friends with in Devo um, that I still you know communicate with today. Uh, you know regarding smoke taint or uh, uh, other things that uh, you know that are that that affect us on a on a daily basis so it's a it's a great support group you know at school i think as well as you know the, those relationships that i have uh with them uh outside of school now yeah and that's a good point and i you know i would say that with, with devo we you know the the key is for everybody to join and be involved which of course it's easier to say than to have that done and make sure everybody feels comfortable there and so forth. And as Beth mentioned earlier, uh, next year, the Devo will have a DEI officer for the first time, which is great. And we're trying to get students to meet each other earlier on in the career, and, you know, and they don't see each other very much in the first couple of years of an undergraduate degree that makes it a, a challenge or they just get here from transferring. How do you get students channeled into a group like that? Um, and accepted in the group and part of that group is, is something that we're working on now. Um, there's a there's a comment, uh, such a, uh, this is a comment I think from something Miguel said. Um, we've worked with Boys and Girls Club of America. They offer excellent guidance in their clubs to students about how to get into college. 
not sure if they're active in the wine regions, what other resources can we support to help get the word out, provide guidance to students for getting college guidance? So I'm not sure if any of you know of organizations that you've worked with. I haven't. We have an internal program at, at Silverado Farming Company where we help our employees um, kind of train them and, and, and guide them for their kids. Um, there's been so far two Davis grads after I went there that, that were able to go into the B&E program and, and graduate. So that's like a great pride of mine mm -hmm. that I was able to, to guide two kids to go into the same program. Uh, in Napa, I think the grape growers um, do a lot of education and training for parents. Uh, but I'm very Napa centric, so I'm not familiar with other area. Great. Um, there is a question of we, uh, several of you have mentioned Devo. Uh, D Devo is um, depart, I think it's a Department of Enology and Viticulture Organization. Davis Knowledge of you know it's it's funny I never think about what it actually stands for, but it's a student organization at UC Davis focused on enology and viticulture. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a, a point that someone's making that uh, they think is a great panel. Um, Women of the Vine and Spirits offers a student membership of five dollars per month. Um, uh, they're talking about a pride alliance group as well as people of color, winemaker, entrepreneur, working moms, and so many other groups to support one another in our career and life journey. So I guess that was more of a comment than a question. Um, can, can any of you, I wonder if any of you would like to uh, give us an idea of you know, if there's one thing that you could change at UC Davis or in the industry um, that would make a huge difference in diversity, equity, inclusion in the industry, what, what would that be? Or even small things that you think of or that you do that you think would be it would be good to have more support for that for that from the industry. I mean, I just sort of, I mean, and this could be completely a reflection of, of my own uh, personal resources at Davis, but it, and I'm so glad like, like UC Davis is putting on this, this whole panel right now, right? But I, I do feel like when I was there, which was not that long ago, it wasn't a big topic of conversation. Um, and maybe it was internally and I wasn't aware of it, um, but it, it didn't feel like it was something that there was an open conversation about necessarily for, for students. And so I think just being more active and audible about that would be would be something I would say for today. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I wonder, you know, this is something that, that you were talking about, Miguel, and some of you, some of the, uh, I think some of, the rest of you mentioned this as well. This idea of educating parents and educating students about this being a great career. I, w I was wondering, um, you know, in terms of the communities that that you live in um, and work in, um, you know, I think occasionally we've gone to high schools or had high schools come to us, as Andy was uh, talking about, or community college and so forth. And I wonder. Um, in your travels through high school and community college in these communities, were there ever organizations that came in and talked about winemaking or grape growing as careers? And, and is that an opportunity maybe for, for the future to get some of even existing organizations together to, to do that in a more concerted effort? Um, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I, I went to St. Helena High. Uh, this was a long time ago. I'm old. <laughs> and there was nothing like that that I remember. Um, I think there is now. I think there's like a beauty culture program at the at the high school where they're teaching kids. Mm -hmm. um, but more never. So visits would be great in my opinion. 
Yeah. Because I think about how I know how Gallo goes out to universities looking for diverse groups, you know, to come work, you know, just trying to find some, some just, I guess, like a diverse group of people to come work for them and tap into areas where they're not, you know, like in areas where people aren't really exposed to wines. It's just like I'm saying, I wasn't exposed to wine. So it'd be great if maybe you reach out in that way. Um, not necessarily, you're not going to universities, but high schools or, I never even thought about winemaking or, there's just, it just is not something that would come up or be thought about. And it was, it just happened to be that I was here and fell into it. So I know that Gal is making that effort and probably other larger companies in that way. Great. I think we have time for this one last question. What unique opportunities do you see as winemakers in California on the global scale with regard to DEI and being an old new world wine growing region in a country that is having very robust conversations about race, gender, sexuality, et cetera? I, I think um, the wine industry, you know, uh, in, in the US and California and in Northern California um, specifically, um, you know, it, we're having these conversations where if you go to wine regions uh, elsewhere, uh, where the wine culture is ingrained and has been around for a long time, uh, you know, I, I see more um, uh, diversity. Um, I see more uh, inclusion, in, specifically in, in our area than I see in a lot of other parts uh, of, of the world. And it's, I think it's a lovely thing that, um, you know, a lot of these old, old traditions are, um, specifically in the in the California industry, are uh, much more um, accepting to different perspectives and uh, uh, types of wine as well. I mean, I think when you have a diverse a group of people making wine, you're going to end up with a lot of diverse uh, wines themselves that speak to um, a, a wider variety of individuals. Um, uh, when they taste them, when they drink them, how they share them, the stories behind them. I mean, I've always tried to use, um, you know, my uh, wines uh, to, to try to speak to a wide variety of people just because I, I know a, a lot of people, um, you know, in my immediate community that um, aren't exposed to, uh, you know, uh, diverse styles of wine. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, and, and outreach, I think, is, is difficult, especially when you're talking about high school, you know, uh, you know making an alcoholic beverage. It can be tricky um, uh, uh, to, to get people interested in the industry where, uh, theoretically, they don't have any experience with, um, you, know, um, you know, they don't have wine on the table uh, at home. Um, so... Uh, I think it's a, it's a challenge to be addressed and I don't have any answers, but um, it's, uh, it's an, I'm just having this conversation, I think, uh, right now is, uh, is, a lot, is, a, is a lot more than is being, that is happening elsewhere. Good. Well, unfortunately, we are, are out of time. So I, I appreciate, I would like to thank all of our panelists for this conversation. It was great having you here. Great seeing you all, at least virtually, hopefully in the near future, and we'll see each other in person again. Um, thank you very much for your input. And I think with that, we'll turn. I'm going to be turning it over to Julia Coney, who's going to be moderating the last panel. Hello, everyone. How are you guys holding up? I'm good. Just had a little cup of tea, so I'm feeling like, woo-hoo. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my panel, um, we're waiting on Andre, but it has Teresa um, Priyanka is filling in for Alicia had an emergency. So Priyanka is filling in from Wine Unify and we have John and then we'll have Andre come on. And um, since um, 
I want to go uh, have you all introduce yourselves according to the first letter of your na first name. So it will be John. It's easier that way, Priyanka and Teresa. And then after when Andre comes on, he can go on after Teresa. So you guys can introduce yourself and we can go ahead and get started because I'm excited about this panel because we're talking about this new consumer. And I know Priyanka and I have had this conversation a lot and Teresa, we've actually had this conversation a lot. So for everyone listening, this is gonna be a fun time. So go ahead and introduce yourself, John. Okay, Julia, thank you very much. It's been a very interesting morning. Um, I'm John Marmark, as Julia said. I now am in, do consulting and advisory work, but I also do a lot of analytical, analytical work around the uh, beer, wine, and spirits markets. And so mainly what I'm gonna talk about today is overall market. Um, and I'll go, I'll say a few more words as I get into my presentation with some of the market points. Okay, Priyanka. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Priyanka French. I'm stepping in for Alicia today. We're both uh, board members at Wine Unify. Uh, I'm also a very proud Davis alum mm -hmm. and happy to be here on this panel today, currently working uh, as a winemaker for Signorello Estate. And as Julia mentioned, you know, we've had quite a few conversations about this aspect of the industry and more importantly about the work that needs to be done to make changes and to you know create initiatives to make a difference. So. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. And Teresa. Hi, everybody. I'm Teresa Heredia. I'm the winemaker for Gary Farrell Winery. And um, I have been involved mostly in doing LGBTQ work, working with HRC, donating, attending events on behalf of Gary Farrell Winery. But starting last year, I was working on um, a lot of things related to diversity and inclusion, cultural diversity and inclusion. And so I've been in, in touch with Julia and some other folks trying to put together panel discussions. And I've actually learned a lot in the past year. So I feel like a newbie, but I'm honored to be included in this discussion. Right. And I, um, we talked last week, but John sent, he has some slides and I mean, the data on the slides are just, for me, they were very interesting, like something, you know, but when you see the data, it kind of shows where the population is heading. So uh, John, if you wanna show those slides to everyone, they can, we can, and you can talk through them since you're the, our marketing expert. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Actually, I don't know if I'm the marketing expert. I feel like I'm the old guy on this panel today. So. Um, old is the mindset, old is the mindset. No, just- Well, and actually I say another thing, Julia, well, age, age, age is state of mind. And my wife yeah. still thinks I'm a, a infantile. So that would give you a <laughs> different insight on me. Sorry, I'm trying to rearrange my screen so I can see a few things. Okay. Basically, I just want to give you a couple top line points on the market and um, demographics. And I do a lot of analytical work and I try and look at the facts. And so and it, another thing I should mention is that I've been involved in the industry since, and I've been fortunate to be involved in the industry since my dad put me to work in the vineyards in 1969 when I was 12 years old. And at that point, I didn't think I was very fortunate, but, but it's been very fortunate. I've had the opportunity to work for large companies running divisions, working around the world. And I've seen a lot of the industry and I look back now and especially listening today, you kind of kick yourself of if only we had done some things differently in the past, we would be in an even better place today, but so is life. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things here. This total servings index, we look at how much uh, beverage alcohol is being consumed in the US. And we had this bump in the 80s where it declined and then it went back up. We look at L legal drinking age population. It's been growing con fairly consistently for years. But when you put the two together from 1990 to today, per capita consumption in the US has been flat. And so as an industry, we have kind of looked that we're always fighting for share between beer, wine and spirits. And within wine, you know, we're fighting for share with each other. And just to put it in perspective, this growth of um, for about the last 30 years and uh, servings of alcohol has been about 1.2% a year. Total wine market, most people don't re remember this. Unfortunately, I've been alive for most of the slide or all of it. Um, but when you go back to the 80s, wine industry was growing. And we had the boom of wine coolers. We saw a boom and a growth of wine from roughly uh, 90, 1993 to 2016. 
Total beverage alcohol was growing at 1.2%. Wine was growing at 3.5%. Wine share of beverage alcohol actually grew from about 11% to 18%. And we had an interesting uh, stair step of wine offerings for people as they grew into wine, from wine coolers to what were the old gamut brands. You can email me if you ever like, find out what gamut means the fighting bridles, premium bridles, but we had this on-ramp that allowed people to learn about wines, understand, um, move up the product range at different price points. The interesting thing looking back in 1993, when the growth started, the average baby boomer was 37. And a lot of the industry talks, the millennials aren't doing enough. Uh, the millennials in two more years, their average age will be 37. And so I look at the millennials as being a great opportunity but it's a much different uh, market. I'm just using some uh, 1990 slide and then 2020 and 2040. But in 1990, um, the US population, this kind of gives you a sense that non-Hispanic white is this green bar. And it was very much, uh, non-Hispanic white was a big driver at age 37 to, well, 31 to 50. Non-Hispanic white, I think as an industry by happenstance, our, most of our focus was on non-Hispanic white consumers. It's partly why we have Eurocentric uh, matching of wine and food. Um, and I wish we had thought more about expanding the base for where we wanna look at where we need to be 20 or 30 or 40 years from 1990. And as everybody knows, grapes you know, take a long time to mature and uh, it's a long planning period. But when you look at 2020, and you look at that non-Hispanic white, it's a much different perspective of what we're looking at at the market today. And as we move forward, it's gonna be even fewer non-Hispanic white. And as an industry, um, Julia said earlier, you know, how do you have soul food and wine and match and everything else? We need to be looking at, and I wish we had been looking at 30 years ago, doing more with matching soul food. We did a little bit with Asian food and just, uh, matching certain styles of wine with Asian food, very little with uh, Latin food. I wish we would have been doing it 30 years ago because I actually think we would have much more diverse industry today. And I wish we had more bottles of wine in everybody's table of all races and ethnicities when we started 20, 30 years ago, and we'd see a much different perspective today. Having wine on a table when kids are at the table with their parents has a lot to do with how as those kids mature and become adults, what they drink. And I wish we had done that. Looking back as an old guy, as I say, um, can't change the past, but need to look at how we do better in the future. And with that, Julia, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Oh, Andre has joined us. Andre, can you introduce yourself for me? Sure. My name is Andre Mack. I am the owner winemaker of Maison Noir Wines, uh, sommelier at large at Ensign's Hospitality. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. So here's the thing, like we, we know we need to expand the wine consumer. We know we need to expand more people getting into wine culture. How, like what, what are some ideas that you have, uh, things you've seen over the past year with everybody moving into social? Because I think social media, as much as it's the bane of all our existence, it is a tool for marketing. It is a tool for a new wine consumer. And so how do we translate that consumer moving into it as a as part of the industry if anyone want to start answering like that how do we do that Priyanka I see you shaking your head <laughs> sure I mean uh Julia you and I have talked about this quite a bit and you know whenever I get posed with this question I always kind of go take a few steps back and if you look at what wine really is it's a social beverage it's meant to represent the people that are sitting on the table the people that are drinking it and when you look at how we've been marketing it previously, we're marketing it mainly to people that have already had an emotional connection to the beverage. So we're kind of, we've historically been building up on the fact that these consumers were used to having a bottle of wine on the table, that they're, they're you know, familiar with the concepts of varieties or wine styles or terroir. And when you shift that to see a new consumer, those are um, terms that can be often very intimidating and almost uh, restrictive for them to enter the wine industry. So the first thing that we need to do when we relook at marketing to a new consumer is that we have to create that emotional bond with the beverage. 
And that bond comes through a variety of different ways. It could be their passion for the style of agriculture. It could be their interest in a particular lifestyle. It could come because of their interest in culture or arts or music. But that emotional bond needs to be created before we can really bring them in and you know get them excited about it. And for me, there is no lack of stories. I mean, the wine industry is built around stories. It's just a matter of how we tell these stories. And you know, as um, you said, to make sure that anyone who walks into the tasting room is heard. And it's as simple as that. You look at the person who's sitting in front of you and usually you can gauge their interest. And if they're starting to get a little cross faded, you know, maybe throw a joke in there or two and create that connection so that they want to come back and learn more. Um, that's kind of how, you know, that's, that's the way I really look at the beginning step to bring these new consumers back into the industry. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I think to add to that, I think, you know, from the very get go, I think wineries really need to work on their image. You know, just what's out front, what's on your website? Um, are you showing photos of different cultural backgrounds, people from different cultural backgrounds? Um, what kind of food and wine pairings are you featuring on your social media and on your website? Um, how, how friendly do you look to people from different cultural backgrounds? And I think historically, um, as Priyanka was saying, you know, there's just so much connection in the wine industry to, you know, this Eurocentric image. And so that's kind of who we've been marketing to historically. And I think that we need to market to these different backgrounds. I know we're going to get into the, the different descriptions for wines, but wine speak, wine language, you know, we really need to just embark on a whole new dictionary of wine speak. Well, that will lead to, if we're talking wine speak, one of the things, and if you guys don't have it, I'll tell Carolyn to put it in. Andre has a book called 99 Bottles, and he relates songs in wine. I mean, beverages, right? And mm -hmm. if you read this book, to me, there are certain things that are so fun about it because you forget that this is also a book talking about wine. It's just a fun book relating a song in a beverage. I mean, one of the beverages he relates is Pellegrino, water. Like, But the fact that you can like, some of the songs I didn't even remember. And I actually would start Googling the song just to play the song while I was reading the book because I was like, oh yeah, that happened. To me, that's so fun about wine because it presented wine in a different way to a to me who even worked in wine. I, it, it was so much enjoyment and I learned so much. So Andre, what was the like thought process of that book to relate it to wine? Um. Because I mean, I think wine was always, to me, was always about a story, right? It's it's a, about a it's a, a snapshot of a moment in time. So the idea, whereas I wanted to tell my wine life story through these ninety nine bottles of liquid, mainly wine, alcohol, water, uh, at these pivotal moments in my life, and you get to see how I got to this place. Um, but you know, also what I realized, you know, to talk about your first question, when you um, when you don't see anybody that looks like you doing something, generally speaking, don't think it's for you. And, um, and you know, I'm curious, I do different, you know, I, I dove in, I was okay with that. You know, but I, there was just different ways I thought of, there's always a different way to explain it. Like, and, and you know, I, you know, I went to private school, I, I went to, you know, I, I, I spent the first 15 summers of my life in you know, in a place called Montgomery Place in Trent, New Jersey, although it sounds very regal, it wasn't, it was pretty, you know, it, it, it was it was pretty um, rough, should I say, um, the height of the crack, crack epidemic, but the idea of knowing how to relate in all of those situations and being able to speak to people, I thought benefited me in life. And what better way to talk about wine is to relate it to something that everybody kind of enjoys is music and different styles of music. And I remember when I first came into the wine business, I had a really hard time pronouncing, you know, French words and that, you know, obviously I have a French name, but I don't speak any French. And, you know, my mom took French and everybody in my family is named Henri, but she said Henri and they wrote down Andre, but so here I am. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was funny because the one person, how he related it to me, it's like when you're pronouncing these words, it's, you know, he related it to something that I knew, which was rap. And he's like, the over and out, he's like, ah, ah, ah. And, and the, way, the way that he talked about it made, it made sense to me. 
And I wanted to write a book, you know, I felt like all the definitive books about wine had been written. I wanted just to be able to tell my story to say that, you know, people, you know, there's many looks of people who are involved in wine. They, you know, it's just not this stereotypical person that you would think. And, and for me, I realized that for the, for the first time, it was, gonna be, it was gonna be a lot of people who looked like me for the first time would ever, were ever gonna pick up a wine book, right? Mm -hmm. And I felt like it had to, I wanted to tell stories and along the way, I wanted the information to be native, right? So you learn a, a lot about wine, but it, you're, you're intrigued by the story that you kind of forget like, oh, we just said Chateau Notre Pop, you know, 13 grapes now, it's like 14 with the white, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, and I just wanted to be able to tell the story in that way and make it fun, you know, it looks, it's disguised as like a guide, but it really tells these really personal stories about me. And, I, and I've always felt like, you know, there's many different ways to talk about wine and describe wine. And that was just the subculture of what I found working in some of the best restaurants where, you know, we all had a way of how we spoke about producers and, and different wines obviously it wasn't something that we would say in front of the guests but it was just how we passed the time and that was just something fun and interesting and i just wanted to be able to to share that with people awesome. well looking at language and talking to Risa and even john i'm gonna say if you could change the language in which wine was marketed just say 20 years ago what would you improve upon oh, well oh, back, go ahead john go ahead, john. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead Teresa. no please so I was going to say, looking back, you know, I always said, you know, people would talk to me about wine and they apologize because they drank white Zinfandel or something. <laughs> and I think the first place we have to start is the best wine in the world is the wine you like best and keep it simple. And we also have to remember that, you know, the majority of people don't go to taste winery tasting rooms. We need to make wine part of an everyday life. I truly believe that um, Bianca said it's a social beverage. It needs to be at the dinner table at home. And social is being around your family and being able to drink wine with your family and children learning that it's part of everyday life. And, you know, I can't tell you how to do it. I know how I've done it with my family and my grandchildren and things. It's different in every household. You know, again, how to, what wine terms? As you said, Julia, why weren't we 20, 30 years ago talking about this is the way you match wine with soul food. This is the way you match wine with uh, tamales. I don't know, whatever, pick it. Mm -hmm. The reason I said that yesterday I had family over and I was telling them about this panel and I'm from the South. So my setup was, I literally had oysters, had crawfish pies, I had shrimp po' boys, but that was my setup for food. And of course I'm pouring different wines. And I think like the reference of, they kept going, oh, I thought you would have something fancier than this. And that was a concept to them because it was like, all these nice wines with something we normally always have. So the question is, how do we get from, like, how do we bridge that it can have Eurocentric food and part of that language, but culturally at most people's homes, you don't eat that. Most people are eating macaroni and cheese and sometimes it's craft, sometimes it's fancy and sometimes it's Annie's. Like being realistic, like about the way we're presenting food and wine, if it's on the table, whose table are we, talking about though because my I, dinner table looks different than it than Priyanka looks different than Andre's I mean it looks different than Teresa's so when we're talking about having it on the table but the images we are seeing are not presented with the mac and cheese or you know potato chips or just like ham I mean Andre has a ham bar so I mean mm -hmm. things like that so how do we get more people who actually want to drink the consumer where they feel wine belongs on their table with their dishes. Well, I, I think, think we need a dictionary. Oh, I'm sorry, Priyanka. No, no, we need no, no, a dictionary. No, no. We need a, a cultural wine wheel. You know, we have this aroma wheel. Let's let's make a. I mean, Andre created 99 bottles. I my you know vision has been to create the cultural wine wheel that features descriptors, specific spices and types of food. Like my wife is Caribbean. So um, thinking about the music and the food, you know, if we can, you know, talk about both of them. I mean, I think our culture wheel needs to include flavors like mango and uh, adobo, which is, you know, probably the key seasoning in Caribbean cuisine. Other descriptors that we can definitely use to describe wine, we can pick out these different flavors. Wine doesn't just taste like, or and smell like brioche or coulis or cassis. You know, we need to make it more broad. 
Is that working with like education bodies to actually change the language? I believe so. I think we need, we talk about the Arima wheel in, in school. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about the cultural wine wheel and let's talk about different cuisine pairings with food. You know, and um, I can get into a little bit more about what we've talked about doing at the winery to try and bring in more, you know, diversity to the winery, more cultural pairings with local restaurants, ethnic cuisines. I agree on that. I, um, sorry, Julia, I'd love to like uh, just build up on that a little because when I got into the industry, I, I was lucky to be at Davis where, you know, Mike Ramsey, when he would set up his sensory, blind sensory uh, tastings in, in our a part of our sensory lab, he identified my struggle because I didn't know what root beer was. And so then he would kind of take me on the side and walk me through what root beer was. And the whole uh, family of berries, that was pretty unknown to me as well. You know, we don't really have berries growing up in India. And so one of the most intimidating parts of wine in general for me when I came in was to now realize that I had to learn this whole new vocabulary to not be the person at you know, production tastings that wasn't identifying things the way everyone else was. But I agree with what Teresa said, because with Wine Unified, we have all of these, you know, we have young candidates who maybe are not working in wine, and then we have established candidates who are looking to advance their careers. And we'll sit down and we'll taste wine with all of these amazing individuals from different you know, parts of life, different walks of life. And to hear what people are picking up on has been such a fun journey because that is your perception or your aromatics, the descriptors that you go to, they're so interlinked with your cultural upbringing and the aromas and flavors and textures and uh, things that you're familiar with. And that doesn't mean that they're wrong descriptors. It just means that those are the familiar words. The so world think, of wine doesn't actually talk about the world of wine. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, like I pick up cumin, for example, in a lot of wines and there have been tastings where I've been told, no, that's not true. And I'm like, well, I also cook a lot with cumin. So I feel like I know that there is cumin in this wine, you know, and it's a matter of just making that that conversation more open so that when people do pick up on things that come from their ethnic backgrounds or their racial backgrounds, that they're not dismissed. I think that is step one, is to be open about the fact that perceptions are different and they're supposed to be that way. And that's one of the coolest things about wine is when you sit on a table, everyone is tasting or smelling something different from you. And that's, and I think, at least for me, that's what I teach. It's like, no, 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 this is not formal. The first thing that comes to mind, say that, right? Because generally it's a, it's a, a taste memory thing where you're like, oh my God, like I, that smells like Big League Chew, bubble gum when I was a kid. Or, you know, the one you know, lady that was there that said, you know, this reminded me of when my grandfather used to pick me up. And I said, so what about it? Was it like, did he have an aftershave? Like, what was it? And she's like, well, no, he, you know, he's had like a, uh, you know, a couple of things of cigarellos in his, in his shirt pocket. And I was like, oh, so what you're smelling is cedar and maybe some tobacco, right? There's a way to translate it. But I think what makes it fun is it's like to say what it is and we can always backtrack to figure out exactly what that is or somewhat in that field. But that to me, that makes it the fun part about wine. And I tell people, don't give up. Everybody wants to give up their power to say, oh, I don't know anything about this. You're an expert in your own taste. You don't need anybody to tell you whether this hamburger tastes good or not. Right, you're gonna put it in your mouth, you're gonna taste it, and you can say this. Somehow wine is different, right? Where you come, it comes with, you know, tasty notes that are elegant, you know what I mean? Like this fantasy world, but like, when's the last time you ever sat down at a cocktail bar and looked at a cocktail and they told you the list of ingredients, but they never told you what you would taste, right? You know, so I always just felt, it was always just like this, it's all this extra stuff that really doesn't need to be there. And as you start to peel back some of the layers of the onions and get down to the crux of what it is, Let's start there first and then start to back up, right? And I always tell everybody, tell, tell me what you smell here. You, you know what I mean? Like there's no right or wrong answer. And that's when people start to like, they relate it to things that they, that's in their everyday lives. Like for you, you said, I smell human. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's something that you're around all the time and that, that's what you get. And, um, and some other people may not pick up on that. And I think that's the beauty of it all. And once we start to embrace that more and say that there, we always say there's no, there's no wrong answer and those kind of mm -hmm. things, but people still aren't, um, you know, they don't feel comfortable enough to, to say, well, what do you taste? You're the expert. And I was like, well, I'm not, I'm expert in what I like to drink. I wrote this wine list, 
<laughs> right? But like, I'm just, I'm just a tour guide, right? I'm, I'm just here to, to get you to that place of, of you, what you say you like. And, you know, so be confident in that. Like, I mean, we don't give away our power in anything else, really. You know, it's like, well, this is, you know, in wine, I'm not sure what I want. And I think to help people through that is just to keep, you know, make it simple and make it in the broadest terms. Like, why do you have to learn another language to do it? Right? You say, hey, you know, this smells like this, this smells like that. And you say, okay, well, so maybe that's, you know, this. I always get banana when I, you know, smell bougie. I don't, you know? <laughs> yeah. Teresa, what are you? Oh, sorry, John. Go ahead. I was going to say, Andre, that's a great point because a lot of wine has become too in intimidating, and you know, mm -hmm. people who don't know it don't understand all the terms and everything, and so we, mm -hmm. you know, almost push them out. And we need to make it more inclusive. Joey, you were asking about, you know, and Andre said, keep it simple. I remember in the '90s with the uh, premium varietals, five dollar uh, Glen Ellen or Sutter Home. And it was like, how do we just put a bottle of wine on the table with meatloaf, you know, in the middle of the week? That's all we were looking for. And we need to do the same thing across all uh, households today, I truly believe. Well, I think- I, Oh, go ahead, Julie. The, the movies have like, you know, movies have made it like, one of the things and I referenced it earlier that I loved about Uncorked was like, here's a family sitting down at a Sunday meal. And most families have a Sunday meal where they gather and have whatever food. And one person's explaining wine and they're like, okay, but then you see all this soul food. And that was the first time in a movie, you really are seeing different types of food in a wine movie that really isn't like super fancy, it's just somebody's Sunday dinner. So I'm always thinking about when I talk to people, what are you having for Sunday dinner and what does that happen to be? And like, you can spend a little or you can spend a lot, like we're talking to people, but in, in every day, you know, people are buy, people buy wine and they plan to drink it that night, right? That's the majority of a consumer. They're buying it. They're not trying to age it. They just want to have it with, that's why I'm always relating food, wine a lot of times to like fast food or just home cooked food. They're very comfort food, right? When we think of wine, we don't think of comfort food. I mean, who, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, anything like that, that comforting chicken noodle soup, like not because you're that sick, because you just like, fries. yeah, like you like French fries, like you just like it. So Teresa, you were saying, what are you guys doing at the winery now? Like since everything happened, you guys are implementing new things to like bring people aware to awareness. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the concepts and ideas, you know, have been taking place very slowly because of COVID because we, you know, are still not fully open, but the goal is to create um, small bite pairings at the winery. So these are things that we've already done, but most of the small bite pairings we've done are your traditional, you know, kind of fancy cuisine, you know, very Eurocentric, um, you know, French bites of food, you know, mushrooms and Pinot Noir. We make mostly Pinot and Chardonnay, um, brioche, and, you know, just small bites that take that into account. But I, we, we want to put together small bite pairings that are, you know, like Chinese food and Pinot and Chardonnay. Indian food and Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. We did these, you know, we did this luncheon in Washington DC at Rasika at an Indian restaurant and our wines paired beautifully with those foods. It was just really hard to come up with the descriptors in the wine specifically that, you know, that we can use to pair to, to well, to talk about the pairings in specific, you know, specifically related to the wine. Same thing with the Chinese restaurant. We did a dinner, a wine dinner at a, um, a Chinese restaurant that has a whole wine library in Miami. And same thing, you know, but the, we can talk, you know, oodles about the different flavors that we get in the foods, but it's really hard to think about what flavors specifically we're picking up in the wines. And this is where I think, um, Andre, I think you're right. We need to just kind of freely use these descriptors, but I think this is how we create the dictionary and the, you know, cultural aroma wheel. I think we all need to just come up with these different terms. Do you so those are some things we're doing. Other places to do, other, place, other wineries to really kind of go, that's going off the grid, right? That's technically saying we have a tradition, but we're throwing the tradition to the wind for a, a while to see what something new can stick. Do you think- Or forever. Or forever. <laughs> People are hesitant. A lot of places are hesitant to that change. Like one of the things like Abbey Creek in Oregon, if you go to their tasting room, they sit, they have fly pr fried plantains as chips instead of crackers. Yep. Right. That's not, for, you know, you don't see any cars, crackers. So it's a very different experience if you go there. And also like the music is hip hop. Right. It's a totally different, you know, it's not classical. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
are you seeing maybe with colleagues a hesitancy to really like you want to embrace the change you know you should but is something holding you back into why you need to you know going forward change is slow people are you know very it's we think that you know from inside the winery we're afraid to implement these changes because we're afraid to of um you know turning off the people who've been coming to gary farrell for a really long time but do we want to keep just that small group of clientele or do we want to expand that and really explode it and invite people from all over the place that's the goal right but it's really slow to implement these changes because we're afraid of turning off other people i would say but looking at like john's data that he presented i mean for the next 20 years that is going to be a new group absolutely it's, i mean the, the data is showing is going to be a new group yeah so how do we go from that what we are now to this new group without somebody's feathers has to be ruffled right that's, yeah. that's the thing it, it's kind of like we were talking earlier you got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable but how do you bridge both of those i mean Andre, you're in the restaurant, so I think it's kind of easy because you're there. I mean, literally, you're there working and you're able to like bridge this gap. But do you have any advice for maybe anybody that's in the winery, in the wine, like the tasting rooms? I mean, you, you know, you know about that. So how do you bridge this gap of this new consumer with our current clientele and how do we bring them together? I think it's, I think it's slowly. I don't think it should be a, a 180. Gary Farrell had a, a vision of what he wanted to have, and he had that. You know, Abbey Creek, that's that's his vision. That's what he wanted to create. He created that. And I feel like as you want to start to slowly bring people in the fold, you know, for me, it's always been, you know, listening to the youth, right, so to speak, right? Like, you know, you have some younger people on the staff, you know, maybe let, let them pick or have a friend's night or let them curate a night to slowly start to integrate those things and change the things. No one, you know, I still want to have the Gary Farrell experience, but... I think we all just want, to, want it to be a little bit more inclusive, right? And so I, so you know what I mean? Like I would never ask anybody to say, hey, like you need to play this music because this is, this is what I like to hear, but it's not my place. It's not my vision. And I think, I think no one's asking anybody to really do that. They're asking just to bring people in the fold and, and maybe reach out to a, a younger audience or, or, or different people, you know? You know, what we've seen other places, which has been pretty interesting is, um, you know, at like the Soho house, Anybody who's under 27, they get a discounted membership, right? And that was one way for them to turn over, you know, what they had was, you know, they had a certain type of clientele that was going there, the finance guy, blah, 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 you know what I mean? And all these things, and they turned it over, uh, you know, they gave discounts to creatives and people under 27 to kind of, you know, maybe that's a way, you know, give it, offering a discount to someone under a certain age to, to encourage them to be a part of it. Uh, and kind of create these nights and those things and slowly that all becomes in there. Now, you know, now they're over 27 and, but now they're, they're part of the Gary Farrell family and now they, you know, they feel comfortable in a way, right? You've kind of, they've kind of, you know, climbed the ranks, so to speak, or gone through the system. Um, no, that's what I look at it. I, I look at it in this way of like, you know, just, in, you know, making it a little bit more accessible, not this thing of like changing your whole thing upside down. Like you don't want to like, totally you know alienate your whole customer base right but you just want to you want it to be a little bit different and so i think you start to make those smaller changes that kind of help mm -hmm. like create this bigger vision and doesn't have and it's not a overnight thing in my opinion it's gonna it takes years just like those you know the data that john put up it's going to take years it's going to happen but it's going to take years it, and i guess the question is what we should be asking ourselves what are we doing to to encourage that or to be a part of that or embrace that when it happens no, Could I add to that really quickly? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that it's really important to, adding on to what Andre is just talking about, it's really important to train your staff on diversity. You know, if we're going to welcome people from different cultural backgrounds, we need to educate them on what are these different cultural backgrounds. You know, what, is it, what does it look like to be from a different cultural background? You know, we need to be welcoming of, you know, different hairstyles, different jewelry, different ways of dressing some people are some cultural some cultures are not than others you know and you walk into a winery and the winery experiences tend to be really quiet and toned down you know classical music and soft jazz and you know soft pop music but no crazy hip-hop no bachata no you know what i mean like let's open it up and make it fun anyway that's it 
Do you I agree. Think I'd love to add on that because we're in the process of redeveloping the Signorello Hospitality Program. And I agree with what Andre said. It's not a 180 degree shift, but you know, we're thinking of the younger consumer doesn't really want to just sit down and taste wine and have bites. They want experiences with it. So a lot of our new hospitality stuff will involve like a cheese making class with wine or really connect it to an experience that still has elements of the same philosophy of winemaking in terms of sustainability, environmental responsibility. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, we're gonna do these pop-up kind of pop-up shops uh, with a couple of different chefs from the Bay Area from all kinds of uh, backgrounds as well. And so when your program is designed to be inclusive, just as an overall overarching program, when you're saying, we're gonna have a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you're automatically going to bring in a clientele that represents each of those different facets. So it doesn't have to be, you know, work. I think the minute you start to think about it as we're going this way or that way, you're kind of losing track of what inclusivity actually is. The point of being inclusive is that you want a little bit for everyone. You want something in there that's going to connect with everyone. Well, how does that work if somebody doesn't, like, you know, you have a lot of smaller wineries, right? They don't have a hospitality program. I believe this is when you could really do an impact in social media. I yes. mean, as we saw this year, social isn't going anywhere. And I mean, like I say, it's the bane of all our existence. We kind of have, we have to do it, I mean, in a way. But I think that can give a unique perspective. I mean, there was a comment in the chat, in the Q&A box, where somebody had never heard about mango talking about wine, right? And... Like, wouldn't that be interesting? Like if you all did a whole Gary Pharrell Caribbean tasting? Oh yeah. And I mean, literally like virtually where some, because I mean, we're still gonna have to have the virtual because everybody can't just all of a sudden go to wine country. You know, a lot of people were hurt by the pandemic. So we also have to be very conscious financially of people who can't just go and visit. But how do you keep those consumers who you met virtually as connected as in a physical space? Mm -hmm. And we are planning those kind of virtual events to continue down the road. We had them developed before the pandemic hit. So we were ready to roll. And so we're planning on continuing them. Um, but social media as well. Um, we are planning to do, in fact, we had planned a, a wine dinner with the local, with the local Peruvian restaurant, Sason. He and I were going to do a wine dinner together, a virtual wine dinner. But then the, the date that we had it scheduled, um, you know, it was around the time that we were fully reopening and he was getting ready for, you know, indoor dining. And so we had to postpone it. I think we're going to do it in July. But those are the kind of things that we're going to continue doing that and, you know, food and wine pairings with different cultural backgrounds. And yes, absolutely Caribbean cuisine will be included because we're going to have some mango and some Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and Mofongo and oh. some bachata. We got to have some music too. Can you, do you, can you explain to people what Mofongo is? Because I think people may be on the call, may not know what that is. Yeah, well, okay, so mango is just smashed platanos, sp smashed plantains, you know, with a little bit of salt. Um, sometimes, you know, you can have some, well, obviously there's garlic in it because Caribbean cuisine are, always includes garlic. And mofongo is basically um, like mango, it's um, green platanos, both of them, mango and mofongo. But mofongo is the platanos smashed up, and then you usually have some sort of a, um, like a simmered garlic sauce that you pour over the top. Um, there's often um, chicharron, so fried meat fried pork mixed into the mofongo. A lot of times it comes with a, like a red crab sauce that gets poured over the top. It's just basically the, the vector for these delicious sauces. And I have a question for everyone to answer. Where do you see tasting notes going? And the reason why I say I want to bring up tasting notes with you all is because tasting notes to a lot of people, they don't understand them. A lot of consumers, I, I deal with a lot of consumers, they don't understand tasting notes. And they don't understand why they exist because in their mind, when they go to research a wine, it doesn't explain anything to them per se. So what do you feel about like the way of tasting notes? Should they evolve? Should they stay the same? Should they get shorter, more concentrated on the consumer? Or should there be like, because think about it, like when you read a lot of the websites, I mean, the language, I'm a writer by trade too. So I understand the flowery language used to describe a wine. But if I'm a person going to buy that wine, you know, or someone explained it to me and I'm looking at my phone and I'm looking it up on the website, where do you see tasting notes is going? Because I see tasting notes in consumers like very equal in a way, but a lot of consumers just don't know how to read them. Cause I think they are kind of technical 
and there's not a space for the consumer side of a tasting note? Uh, I think for me, we, I don't know where they go. I, I don't believe in them. If you read my book, um, yes. I kind of totally make fun of them. You know, I relate wine or pair wine to it, well, my book to, um, to situations, right? You know, that kind of thing. But for me, I, it's been music, a situation, painting a picture. You know, I think more for me, it's like painting more of an emotional connection to, to something. You know, this is like, you know, walking the crap across freshly mowed grass eating, you know, a handful of Skittles or something, you know what I mean? Like for me, you know, like just painting something different. I, I look at it as an area to, to be humorous, um, but still get across the point of like, okay, fresh cut grass. Like I understand, I, I understand what that is. It's kind of grassy, but he's eating like Skittles or fruity, you know, that kind of thing. I try to have fun with it because I think in some ways it's kind of useless to the average person. Right. And then it, then it's just like, well, are there strawberries in here? Are there blueberries in here? Like what's in here? This kind of thing. But, you know, I try to I make fun of it. So that's that's what I do. Oh. Uh, you know, I you know, I, I recently just I, I mean, I use emojis to describe a wine because it just feels like, you know, that's an easier way to look at it. Here's these pictures. There it is. Boom. That's it. Um, and, you know, we've been I've been doing a lot of that kind of stuff. And some people have been upset. But I just I think the modern tasting note is kind of useless for from. For, for the masses in that way, if you're not like early in the industry. Can you, can you, so explain, can you explain about people being upset? What do you mean? Can you explain well, I think, that? I think, yeah, I think, you know, I think for a lot of people, you know, they look at what I do as like, you know, maybe like dumbing down wine too much or something like that. My thing is like, what difference does it make? We, we all use emojis. We didn't, we thought it was silly, especially, you know, of a certain age, right? And I was like, what are we doing? What are they putting on here? Like, but the idea that like, hey, like, I understand that, like, you know, this is this, you know, that, you know, we put different things on it. This is how it makes me feel. I feel like this, I talk a lot about mine in a way of an emotional connection, you know, how it makes me feel, that kind of thing. And the easier way to co convey that to me was through emojis, um, which is emo it's like exactly what they are. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, sometimes, you know, when you introduce something new, people, uh, you know, people are upset. They feel like that you're like, you're, um, you know, changing, you know, their, their culture or changing, you know, what they love, you know, certain part about wine. You know, I made wine t-shirts, people didn't like that, but you know, I just did it, you know, you know, just we, you're in control of that. So I just decided to change it. So I don't, I make fun of tasting notes. That's just my thing. And I think at some point they'll, they'll go to a different way. I mean, we've hired impersonators to do different voices to, 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 to say them, you know, just different, just like, trying to make it fun and interesting, but it's kind of kind of useless in a way. I mean, in, in a way, outside of a way, technical, sometimes it's good, you know, depending on who's riding it. But like, from all intents and purposes, for me, it doesn't really work. We don't, in our wine shop, we don't, we don't write anything. Everything's a conversation. The person we offer what we call table side service, you know, based off my restaurant background. Someone comes and talks to you. And if that's too much, when it, if you have any questions, come to me with the questions, but we, we don't write, hand write anything and have it posted on anything. Okay. That's my Teresa. No, I love it. <laughs> Teresa, what do you think? Tasting notes. Would I be, uh, would I be uh, offensive if I, if I had a differing opinion, Andre? <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, Sorry. I'm just kidding. I do think that we are, we need to go in that direction. Um, but I think that people have come to expect, you were talking about this, you know, it's difficult to change. People have come to expect some sort of a description. Like when I first started drinking wine, I couldn't afford to just go and, you know, buy European wines and just drop cash on these great bottles of wine. So I actually relied on those descriptions. You know, I would carry out a little printout of, you know, the vintage descriptions and, um, you know, the different regions of the world. So I could have an understanding of, you know, what, what to try from where and I relied on those descriptors, even though those descriptors were very Eurocentric. So I think we need to work again, getting back to the terminology, the wine speak, the wine verbiage, the wine dictionary. I think that our tasting notes need to evolve into something new. And maybe we incorporate these, you know, emotional descriptions in addition to different cultural descriptors, musical references, making it more fun and engaging for people something that taps into those emotions like Andre's talking about. John, your thoughts on tasting? You've been in marketing a long time, so you've seen a lot of notes. I think they've gotten ridiculous and more ridiculous over time. <laughs> um, and I, most times I want to throw them away because I actually don't think they're that useful. Uh, apologies to be so blunt. 
<laughs> but, but I also think there's this, I have a difficult time with tasting notes because it's like working in a restaurant and reading the table and understanding what they want or need. You know, everybody needs something different. And what we wind up doing is making it all homogenous and everybody's going to get the same thing. It doesn't work. And I think almost like uh, we almost need the human notes and the technical notes. And how do you start to put tasty notes together so you can hit both sides? You have to almost maintain a mistress is saying people need them, but you need to make it like two pieces or something. And most times you don't have enough room. I don't have the answer to how to get there, but somehow we, as Andre is saying, we need to evolve it because where they are today, they are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Rianca, I see you're laughing. <laughs> laughing because what tasting notes has been a journey for me personally um because when i when i got when i had to write my first tasting notes for the wines i made at signorella estate i dove deep you know i was so passionate i like i was like i made these wines i want people to know all the layers that i have been you know working for the last 18 months to create like i want you guys to know what i think this wine is and i work i like spend hours going back to the glass and my husband who's on the sales and marketing side was just like what are you doing who's going to read this and i the disconnect was so apparent between the production side and the sales side that it kind of shook me because i was like what do you what do you mean no this is what like this is how you describe it right i mean how are people going to know why this wine is different and he kind of you know put it in context he goes yeah when you send it out to maybe your distributors or you send it out to people in the wine chain, yes, they're looking at it and they're, you know, they're making use of it. But think about the sheet that you're gonna send to, for example, your club members with this wine. Do you think they're gonna sit and read your six sentences of all these flowery terms and say, yes, that is exactly what I tasted in her wine. And I thought about it and I was like, okay, I see where he's coming from. So we actually released a brand new wine allocation only. And I figured this is the perfect wine to experiment, you know, my new strategy with. And so what I did was I made it all graphic. And for each of the graphic descriptors, I linked it to our vineyard blocks because it's all 100% estate and it's all coming, you know, from this area. All of our club members, most of them have been to the estate. So they kind of can now put a little bit more together of why I think these different blocks are doing what they're doing in this final blend that they've Put, we've put together and we actually had people email us back and go that was so cool and so I'm still um I'm, I, I'm bordering the fence right now where the winemaker in me wants to put all that writing down but I understand that not a lot of people want to read it so I'm still struggling with it well we have a question I think you should put it down oh, I'm sorry <laughs> no I no, think you should no. write it and you should write it 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 you know maybe a, a, a different version of that goes to 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 somebody, you know, it goes, it goes to the consumer. I, I think for me, always wearing the, you know, the professional hat and reading tasting notes, it never does anything for me in that way. But like getting to the technical stuff about it, where it's from and why you picked it from those blocks, I think that's valuable information. Yeah. And I, I love to read those things. It's just more of the other stuff <laughs> that I don't. You know, You're talking about the descriptors, awesome. the descriptions of the wines, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Generally what you what okay. you find, you know, what, what most people are, are turning a bottle over to see, they want to see what it tastes like. So someone asked, does anyone do tasting notes in different languages? Mm. I mean, the thought of being able to think about our population we have in the US, we have like so many different languages, especially Spanish. And like, does, do you all do any tasting notes? I, I don't think I've ever saw a tasting note, in a bilingual tasting note. No, but that's really just a like <laughs> head banger. You know, it's like, duh, we need those. <laughs> we need them in Spanish. We do. I mean, because it's, it's something I just didn't until that question popped up. I had never even thought about it. Mm -hmm. Great question. Great question. But also then if you're having it in Spanish and the part of the tasting note you have is a pairing, <laughs> right? Most tasting notes has a little blurb about a pairing. Mm -hmm. Now, are you pairing the same dish, even though you would do that in a different language? If, if it's Spanish, would you still do the same traditional pairing notes? smells of brioche you know we talk brioche and, and yeast and all that would you say the same thing in a different language culturally if you're speaking of different cultures i, I would think, just change the I think, yeah i think you have to change the verbiage that you're using and forget brioche mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 
exactly. And I, I don't mean that I sound horrible, but um, it just, you got to find the, language, the, the terms you can use that actually translate well. No, I know. The reason I say that, like, I always yeah. say things, people say brioche, I always say cornbread. Like if I'm the two, like the majority of times I'm thinking cornbread, right? right? Most people have had cornbread. Most people know what that tastes like. Most people, some people know what brioche is. Most people don't. Mm -hmm. But that's like the main word if we're describing something. I always just say cornbread and butter. Most people can identify that butter, you know, cornbread, yeast kind of thing when they think of cornbread. But it's all, you know, and I think it just makes it easier. And, you know, we're talking about the language because now we have to use this different language moving to these new consumers. Mm -hmm. Because when, you know, I, I, I'm on the, you know, social a lot and I see people describing a wine and I'm going, who are they describing this for? Because usually on like, especially social, it's like consumer, you may have clientele, but it's, if I'm stumbling on your page one night when I can't sleep and I just look down the hashtag like wine, <laughs> I, I, I'm reading this and I just don't really understand it. So I, I want us to move into even like describing wine, if I want to describe a wine as it's a cross between a Jolly Rancher, a watermelon Jolly Rancher and a Sour Patch Kid, I want that to be able to be valid, right? Whether or not you have had either one, you kind of can recognize I've been at the grocery store and that on the candy aisle, I know what they look like. But usually in writing, that's not really kind of a quote unquote appropriate thing to say. But to me, that's what it, you know, it, it explains a lot. I just say this says who? <laughs> you get to say too, it exactly yeah yeah you get to say it and the more you say it the more it empowers other people to say it and it right. empowers more people to be able to use it and i think i think if you you know we just own that part of it just do it mm -hmm. we need to break down um, this wine pretension right nothing is yeah. acceptable or unacceptable we just need to break that down yeah, well yeah, a lot absolutely. of people may not know i work in wine retail so i work in sales in washington dc mm -hmm. and we're, we're doing all our shelf talkers and we're removing any shelf talker that has a person's name that gives a gives a rating or points. And it's a lot, right? Because you re, you're re-flipping a store. But the reason why is people are going to ask me, do I like this wine? What are my top 10 kind of this week or this month or this quarter? And so we're saying like the staff likes this with the and pizza from across the street because it's a fast casual restaurant across the street. So we're we're making the the shelf talker more relatable as people get off the metro. The restaurants are right there. We're actually doing like some of the sparkling. We're, we're, we're pairing them all with French fries. One of the notes is everybody is going to pick a place and say which French fries goes with what sparkling wine to, to make it fun, to take the like, to, to make it light. Even though you're selling an, a nice champagne, we can say, hey, it goes with this fast rest food restaurant's French fries. And do you think that's dumbing down the wine experience? No, I don't. I, don't. Think I, think, at all. I know because people are still buying it. They're like, oh, this is fun. I never mm -hmm. thought about that. Yeah. And they're looking at that wine in a different way because also it's, it's trying to like for years. And as someone says in the comments, you know, sparkling wine was always a celebratory thing. And so when now we're trying, everybody's trying to say, oh, it's still a wine. And how do we sell that? And how do we market that? And so it's looking at wine in different ways. <laughs> As people look at, I mean, I will say we, we've all lived through a pandemic. It's a celebratory day every time we can open a bottle of wine and be healthy. That is how I look like, no matter what that wine is. And so it's to be enjoyed. And so looking at that perspective is one of the things I want us as like the industry and as we're trying to move people into these programs, how do we bring the fun into wine? Because sometimes now it doesn't look fun. It looks like we all know it's a job and hard work, but it just doesn't look as enjoyable as it all. We all know wine is. Mm -hmm. and I'm that's always what, having fun. I'm what'd you say? You I'm always, always having fun. <laughs> I'm always having fun. I mean, <laughs> but how do we bring that to, uh, to? How do we get other people to, to see it that way, though? I mean, you you're that way, but I mean, I think also that's your natural personality too. Yeah, I think for me, it's just more just. It's just me. I just lead by example. This is how we, how I talk about wine. These are the wines I drink. This is my thing. I think, um, obviously, through social, um, you know, and I've been this way for a very long time. So, you know, pretty much, you know, the whole time I've been in the industry, even working, you know, if you ever got to know me working at, you know, some of the top restaurants in the world, you know, it was, you know, I had the same amount of humor. I talked to the staff in the same way about wine. You know, I had to button it up a little bit with when I went to a table, but they got the dress up. So, um, 
Yeah, I just think just through time, it, it's, it's changing. You, you see it already. Um, but, you know, I think it's with the gatekeepers and the industry people. And as that starts to change um, and how we talk about wine and how it's perceived um, as commercials, you know, like as, as advertising and marketing change, as, as cultural people become this, this tipping point, you know, the fact that you could watch a show with LeBron and a lot of your, a lot of heroes on a, on a show called The Shop and they're talking about 90 Latour, which, you know, most people will never get to taste, but the idea that they're like, oh, I gotta have that. And you're starting to see the way social media is really kind of letting you into the lives of, of a lot of these people who, who are admired for, for whatever their talent is. And the mm -hmm. fact that, that they're drinking wine and that they're sharing those things with everybody else starts to change the narrative in which you're gonna see in droves way more people coming to wine and going to shops because they saw somebody who they admired that that's, that's what they drink. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I did a video and I'm using a corkscrew to open a thing and I don't know how many people have written me to ask me, what's that corkscrew? I wanna buy that corkscrew, you know what I mean? And I'm just me, I'm just opening the thing. But like the idea that like you see, you know, LeBron and you think of just like how magazines have changed, you know, on the cover you had two sports figures, two basketball players, Carmelo Anthony on one, you know, those are huge shifts, um, you know, that you, that, that you won't see right away, but that's a long tail that, you know, all of those people are, are coming behind them at some point because wine has become this thing and now they see people who look like them. And so I think you'll, you'll, we'll see it because then with, with that comes, becomes a different language, right? With that comes, you know, different cultural things and how they interact with wine that could become part of a wine thing. You know what I mean? Culturally. So I, I, I think it's interesting, but we're really just at the beginning of it. You know, I, I didn't get to see all of your data, John, and, and I do apologize to everybody in the panel. There was a bus that ran into a building right over here. And I was just like, what is happening? And, and then my assistant's on. I'm gonna blame it on Kevin. He, he's, he's on vacation and I, he didn't set up an alarm. But anyways, there was something happening, but I didn't get to see your data, but it just tells you that, you know, there's gonna be a big shift and you're starting to see a lot of the, the groundwork now. If I had to put on my Malcolm and Gladwell hat and talk about the tipping point here. Well, I Great. think it goes back to representation, which has kind of been the base philosophy for Wine Unify. You know, when this organization came about and Julie and Andre, you've been great support with the founding of that organization. It was the mission behind it is to bring wine professionals, you know, from these underrepresented communities that can then communicate their passion of wine in a way that relates to that segment of consumer. And the minute you have people talking about it in, in their language, their passion, their personality, you know, their stories, their experiences, it just becomes a much more wholesome experience for everyone involved. Um, and it then goes back to how many of the people, how many of themselves are they seeing in the industry? So like with Wine Unify, one of the things we did, we said every mentor that's going to participate is going to look like the people that we're trying to bring in the industry themselves so that they feel safe, they feel comfortable, and they know that whatever idea they bring for the wine industry is going to be heard and appreciated and um, hopefully encouraged in every way possible. Well, that's a great way to end it. Cause I see David on here. He's about to like kick me off because of time. I'm looking at the time. I'm like, I'm three minutes behind, Dave. I'm good. I, I'm three minutes behind. So thank you, Teresa, Priyanka, John, Andre, thank you all for this panel. It was very good. Thank, thank you. you guys for allowing me thank to you very much. Thanks awesome. for inviting Thanks, us. Thanks, guys. Well, I'd just like to uh, close by uh, thanking, first of all, thanking all of you for, for being here and um, and to all of our speakers, panelists, moderators, uh, and so forth. Um, what a wonderful program. Um, I'd really like to send out a special thank you to Karen Block and Caroline Furman, who really organized this whole event, along with the organizing committee, but they did a huge amount behind the scenes to make sure all of this took place and ran smoothly today, and they did a wonderful job. So thank you to them. 
Um, I hope this program has given everybody a lot to think about. I know it's given me a lot to think about. I have notes written all over my pages in front of me, all kinds of new ideas. Some of the comments that came in could end up being whole programs in themselves. So I encourage all of you to realize this is a beginning. It's a beginning for us, a beginning for the industry, um, as Julie and others mentioned. Um, and so reach out to us if you have ideas that you want us to work on, more information that you want for future extension programs. Reach out to other with others with your ideas, to partner with others and your ideas. There are a lot of people here today who want to do something. So reach out to each other to do something. Um, and I hope that all of this will, will uh, result, all of this partner kind of partnership will result in an industry that's stronger, more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive. And so uh, thank you again to all of you and all of our partners um, for extension. Um, we hope you'll come to lots more of our programs in the future focused on this and all other things great and wide. So thank you. Have a good day, everyone.